Thank you all for coming today. This is the second in a series of workshop slash lectures that I've done in uh, that have to do with life mission and also how to bring that life mission from a fifth dimensional consciousness into the third dimensional world. So the last lecture is online and uh, it's about two and a half hours long and it gets more into discovering what your life mission is and how to take that out into the world in a professional way. We touched on relationships a little bit in that, in that uh, particular lecture, but this one I want to go more deeply into that subject area. And it's really timely because we're about to enter a Venus retrograde cycle. Any of you know what Venus retrograde is or no? Okay. Okay. Now nah, that's probably because I talk about it all the time. Well, Venus retrograde, and I've been a student of astrology and numerology for about 23, 24 years now. And in that time, I've, uh, I've come from a very conventional background where I used to, uh, prior to six years ago, my focus was in the business and financial world. I used to be a professional trader. I've run businesses all throughout my life. So I used those tools in not only my own life to understand what was going on with me and where I was going, but also to navigate the business world. I used these tools to forecast the stock markets and to have a feeling for what different companies were doing. So these are tools that I've used in a variety of different ways throughout my life. So what we're going to talk about today is specifically, and the reason for this talk taking place right now about relationships is because we're entering a Venus retrograde cycle, which has to do with the relationships. Venus retrograde is from March 4th through April 15th, and but you are probably already starting to experience some of the elements of that. Even though the cycle is not exact yet, you're going to start noticing some of those signs of what that represents even this early. Because as the planet starts moving into that, that peak period, the influences will start to show. Just like night doesn't turn into day overnight, you'll see those transitions start to happen gradually. Now, Venus retrograde is any planet in our astrology cycles has certain representations. And Venus represents, among other things, uh, things having to do with relationships and love. And it also impacts money. And this is why you may find that in a lot of relationships, one of the most common things that people argue about is money. When the relationship is struggling, oftentimes there's a financial connection to it as well. These are the areas that you're going to find that are impacted by this. For example, you're going to deal with relationship values and have to decide what's important. Venus has to do with our value system and what we value. And relationships are part of that because how we value ourselves impacts how our relationships show up for us as well. In this period of time, if you're currently in a relationship, then it's probably going to bring up things that you need to deal with in that relationship and in order to resolve them so you can move forward in a better way. There are going to be some relationships that are not particularly good for you. And I'm not talking about just romantic relationships, all kinds of relationships. But romantic relationships are going to be affected the most. And there will be issues that come up that maybe are issues that you haven't resolved that you'll have an opportunity to, to take a look at and to see if they're important enough for you to resolve them. Or in some cases, some relationships will not last through this period of time. And you'll have to let them go in, in that window of time. Quite often what happens with Venus retrograde is people who you knew in the past will come back. They may be romantic relationships you've had where there are unresolved issues and they'll just at random call you or contact you and they'll be back in your life in some way in order for you to resolve those issues. You may have soulmates that show up for the very first time in your life. And so people from the past, relationships from the past, whether it's past life or past in this life, will often come back in order to teach you something and in order for you to grow through that experience. So those are some of the things that you will notice. And it may even be some new relationships that may not be soulmates and may not be people from the past, but with similar issues that you never dealt with before. Maybe you had a relationship in the past and you had a certain area where you were blocked and that relationship is gone. Someone may, new may show up that presents the same issue for you to deal with and grow through. 
So this is a time where we will grow through our relationships, not just romantic, but most of the time there is a romantic element to it that that we have to deal with because our romantic relationships are the ones where we learn the most and because we tend to struggle the most in those areas. There's also financial concerns that may come up. Now, depending on, I don't know all of your individual astrology charts, so it's hard for me to say to what degree each of you will be impacted. If you have planets in areas that that Venus retrograde impacts, then you may find that you're more significantly affected by the movement of that planet. When a planet is retrograde, I probably should have explained, astrology, there are different schools of thought on astrology. We're, when we say a planet is retrograde, we're considering, we're looking at the sky from an Earth-centered standpoint, which means that sometimes planets will appear to go forward in the Earth's sky, and sometimes they'll appear to go backward in the Earth's sky, because the Earth is actually not the center of our solar system. And when a planet is going forward in the Earth's sky, it's more, it's stronger, and it's functioning at its more optimal level. When it goes backward in the Earth's sky, it tends to function in a weakened level, and it brings about issues having to do with that planet. Just like Mercury is going retrograde in another uh, month, I think, month or two. And when Mercury goes retrograde, from my experience, I always, I try to avoid te- buying technology during that time because almost everything you buy doesn't work. If I ever have to buy technology during Mercury Retrograde, I will make sure I buy a warranty on it because it, and I've always had to use it whenever I've done that because Mercury has to do with communication and any kind of thing that involves communication, which technology these days always does, will be impacted by that. And during Mercury Retrograde, we can often get into arguments with people in order to learn how to communicate better. So that's coming on the tail end of the Venus Retrograde, actually. So we may have an extended period of first we deal with the relationship and then we have to learn how to communicate better on the other end of that. So whenever a planet is retrograde, we have to learn lessons that have to do with that planet's motion in our lives. And these are some of the the impacts that you'll notice. Now, if somebody comes into your life who is a brand new relationship, who somebody you never knew before, who enters your life during this Venus retrograde cycle, which means pretty much right now this is happening. I can only assume by the size of the group today that everybody's having relationship issues or something. (laughs) I guess we all need to learn in that area, right? Venus retrograde, if you experience, and like I said, the influence is already in motion now, even though it officially doesn't start till later this month you're already starting to experience those effects. So at this point, until that Venus retrograde cycle ends, if you meet someone new in your life, who and and that quite often will happen, there will be a new person who may enter your life in a relationship sense, and a lot of new relationships start during Venus retrograde. It's not usually wise to start a new relationship during a Venus retrograde because the relationships that are started during that cycle will often have difficulties and just in the same way as if I were to buy a computer on a mercury retrograde it's probably going to have problems so I buy a warranty on it well you can't buy a warranty on a relationship but but if you could then you definitely want to do that during a Venus retrograde if you plan to start a new relationship with somebody you have not been in a relationship with before so just keep that in mind and even in their existing relationships that you're in some of you will deal with minor issues others have big issues to deal with and quite often during a venus retrograde the issues are big that you have to overcome and grow through one piece of advice that i'd give you is until the retrograde is over don't make any firm life-changing decisions about that relationship or relationships whether it's a brand new one or an existing one because during the time of the retrograde motion you'll find that decisions that are made will not be the right ones allow yourself to go through the experience and to contemplate your values and decide what's important and once it goes direct then make your decisions on what to what to pursue, whether it's a new relationship or a new rela- a new decision within the existing one that you have. Yeah. When was the last retrograde? Um, about I think eighteen months, every eighteen months, roughly. So about a year and a half is is uh, how often Venus goes retrograde. 
Every planet's retrograde motion causes us to have to deal with difficulties in the particular area that planet represents. And I think it was about a month, a year and a half ago that Venus was. If you want to take up a study of astrology, it's a fascinating area. I mean, it's astrology is a lifelong thing. So if you want to take it up, just plan on never learning it. After 23 years, I haven't learned anything. <laughs> I'm still learning. And... Uh, and it's hard, your, your knowledge grows exponentially. We are going to touch on numerology a bit today, which you can actually learn fairly easily and, and be, uh, and know enough to be dangerous. Uh, where with astrology, it's, it's very hard to learn enough by reading one or two books. You, you have to take it up as, as your own study. And at a certain point, there are no books out there to teach you. You have to, it's your own research and your own development that you will learn from. Now, since most of you were not at my last lecture, I'm, this part here is a, is a bit of a repeat from the last one, but I, I want to bring it up because I think it's important as it focuses on the subjects of this, this particular talk. In 1938, there was a Harvard study. It was called the Harvard Grant Study, and it involved about 400... Harvard students, which at the time were all men, because Harvard didn't allow women at that time, and about uh, 300 other kids who were in the same age brackets, but who were from poor neighborhoods. Originally, there were about 700 people in this Harvard grant study, and the study is still going on today. It is the longest running psychological longitudinal study in history, and it is still going on today with the same students who were, who were in the study when they started. There are, some of them are still alive. I think about 75 or so of them are still alive, and they're in their 70s and 80s now. And the purpose of this study was to identify what it is that makes people happy, what leads to happiness. Some of these people in the study went on to be billionaires, some of them multimillionaires, some of them janitors. There was one U.S. president in the study who wasn't a president when he was in Harvard, but who eventually became president. So we're talking about a group of people who span the globe as far as the kinds of backgrounds that they chose in their lives. And, and they've been studied at least every two years. They had to submit to psychological studies, blood tests, physiological tests, all of their family members were interviewed in order to see how they were doing, the purpose of which was to identify what is it that leads to happiness. And, and they're still ongoing with the study now. What they found was the happiest people versus the unhappiest people, there are very distinct differences between them. The happiest people have greater brain function, they have higher IQ, their memory is much better in their 80s, which the study that's going on now, their memories, the people who are still alive, they have a higher pain threshold, meaning these individuals now are, are much older and they, a lot of them have health issues and many of them are suffering with painful health issues. And what they found was that the happiest people actually had a, a much higher pain threshold, meaning that they can deal with the same kind of pain and not feel it as significantly. They were not uh, debilitated by the same amount of pain as a result of their happiness. They had better overall health into their 80s and they lived the longest. The happiest people had the significantly longer lifespans and the unhappiest people actually had significantly shorter lifespans and they also earned an average of $141,000 a year more uh, at their peak salaries which is between age 55 and 60. So there is a there is a, an effect that happiness has on our income earning ability as well. Now, what was the primary cause? For those of you who weren't at my lecture or didn't watch it online, uh, because you'd be cheating if you answered this question right now, what do you think was the primary cause? Anybody have any ideas of happiness? Now, keep in mind that. Uh, the people's salaries in this study are all over the place, from billions of dollars to people who are very average or below average in income. Not all the Harvard students or the students in the neighborhoods ended up being well off. Yeah? I'd say relationships. Yeah, very good. Relationships. No, good. Yes. Actually, you're right. 
So it wasn't money. And in fact, what they found out was that at $75,000, money stopped making a difference on happiness. People who were making $75,000 a year were not measurably happier than people who are billionaires. Once their basic needs were met financially, it didn't matter to them financially. It wasn't cars, it wasn't mansions, it actually was relationships. The happiest people had high quality social interactions, not just romantic relationships, but they all, the happiest of the happiest people had secure, loving relationships. And that was the number one thing. Now, those people who had secure, loving relationships ended up living substantially longer. And in all respects, their, their, the quality of their life was better. Plus, they earned more money. The people who were lonely in the study or alone or in even worse in relationships that were very unhappy actually had substantially shorter lifespans and their pain threshold was actually lower, meaning they could experience the same amount of pain as a result of health problems and actually it's more intense for them because they're in unhappy relationships. Being in an unhappy relationship is actually worse than being alone. So it's very interesting. Uh, now, there are lots of psychological studies that have been done into these areas, and I'm just going to share one with you. Now, psychologists have this thing. They like giving people electroshock therapy, so there are a lot of electroshock therapy studies out there. This particular study, they, they took uh, women and they put them in front of a TV screen or computer screen, and they said, every so often an X is going to appear on the screen and when the X appears on the screen there's a 20% chance that you're going to be shocked and they hooked them up with electroshock devices and also uh, put devices on their brain to measure their brain activity during this time to see what would happen to these women. The first group of women were sitting alone in this room with this computer and every time the X appeared on the screen, they experienced a severe emotional reaction of fear when they thought they may get shocked. And it was very substantial and very measurable. The second group of women, they actually had um, a stranger, a, an unknown man sitting next to them holding their hand during this test. And the same test that was applied where an X would appear on the screen, there was a 20% chance they would get shocked. And what they found was there was a slight lowering of the woman's anxiety during that test. The third group of women, they had only women who were in secure, loving relationships. And they had the husband sitting next to them, holding their hand. And the electroshock had almost no effect on them. They experienced no stress or very, very small amounts of stress in, in that particular result. So there is a significant effect that, that, that having a loving, secure relationship has on our psychological well-being to the extent that we don't experience stresses the same. We don't experience physical discomfort the same. This is a very important finding because if you consider that about 50% of Americans alone are alone, and if you consider that the 50% who are married in the U.S. especially are getting divorced, or, and of the ones that are still in a relationship or married, probably 50% are unhappy in that relationship. And that leaves a very small number of people in the U.S. alone who are actually potentially in happy relationships and experiencing life to the best possible potential. And, and this has a huge impact on life mission. And that's ultimately what we're trying to get at with this, with this series of talks that I'm doing is you have to, if you want to succeed in life, then you want to align as many things in your favor as possible. And one of the most important things to success and well-being and finding your life mission and pursuing it fully is having a very secure, loving relationship in your life. And in fact, the, in the studies that they've done, they found that even beyond eating a healthy diet or taking supplements, 
having a healthy, happy, secure relationship contributed more to lifespan and health than any of those other things. So if you're taking supplements and you're eating healthy and you're miserable in your relationship or you're alone and lonely, then it's probably not helping you that much. You're just counteracting those effects with the situation that you're in. So it's a really important area that we want to take a look at. And there have been uh, numerous other psychological experiments. There's another uh, one that's kind of interesting that I'll share. This is more of a spiritual psychological experiment. And again, psychologists like to shock people. So they like locking women up in rooms and shocking them. And in this other study, what they did was they, they put women in a room by themselves hooked them up with brain uh, uh, measuring devices and electroshock devices. And so the women are sitting there by themselves. There's a camera that is uh, focused on them. But otherwise, they're, uh, they're in the room with a... Um, I'll give them a minute to sit down. Come on in. We're just getting to a fun electroshock experiment. <laughs> Right, so like I was saying, psychologists like to shock women. I don't know why, but they do, probably because most of them are men who are doing the shocking. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> so they lock these women individually in, in, uh, in rooms with video cameras monitoring their progress and with devices measuring their brainwave activity and they told them that they were going to shock them. And separate from them, these women were all women who were in happy, secure relationships. And separate from them, they put men in another room. And the men were not allowed to communicate with the women in any way, but they could see them on screen, but they couldn't hear or talk to each other. And what they did was... They did several different studies. In one group, they had the women and the men who were watching them were just strangers. They were not people they knew or had any particular connection with. And they asked the men to calm the woman down because they're measuring this woman inside of the room and her brainwave activity is off the charts because she's under stress. And in this particular case, they had a small effect, but not much. Now, mind you, there's no connection between these two people. They're sitting in two separate rooms they can't talk to each other. The only connection is that the man can see the woman on a screen. The woman cannot see the man who, who is watching her. And in another uh, study, they put men in the other room who were their romantic partners, who were in loving, happy relationships. And they gave them the same instructions. Calm your wife or relationship partner down. They couldn't do anything but just intend for that to happen, and in every case, the brainwave activity was calm. So we have an effect on those who we are with, even if we're not physically in contact with them. If they're on the other side of the planet and we simply are existing, but we have that bond, that kind of connection with them, we can affect their experience, we can calm them down emotionally, we can enhance the quality of their life uh, and, uh, and their well-being. So there's so many studies that have been done on this. These are just a couple to illustrate the power of, of that kind of a connection between two people. This isn't just romantic relationships that it happens, and it can also happen with family members and close friends, but it is the strongest when you have a close emotional romantic bond with somebody. So it's amazing stuff that's, that's uh, been uh, done out there. I think it's important for us to spend a little time addressing some of the misunderstandings and misconceptions about attachment, especially to a spiritually based audience, because we are raised in a society and with a lot of spiritual teachings that talk about the inappropriateness of attachment. And I want to differentiate between what is a spiritual attach, uh, what is talked about in, as far as attachment and spirituality, and what is talked about in psychology as far as attachment. Because one form of attachment, yes, it can be problematic. But the other form of attachment, which is psychological attachment and emotional attachment, is absolutely essential for your happiness. So you don't want to misunderstand that.
This is an interesting quote that I thought was important to put in there because it's said by the Dalai Lama, and I think because we're talking about attachments here and spirituality, it's important to understand how much your own happiness is linked to that of others. There is no individual happiness totally independent of others. We were raised, most of us in this group audience, were, were born into that kind of an environment where someday we're going to look back and laugh at the kind of insane things we've done as human beings. But, but how ridiculous it is that parents had to stare through glass windows at their kids who were in little tiny plastic boxes, right? And we thought that was the right way to raise kids. That we thought that, and this was what was taught in previous psychological uh, research prior to recent times. Nowadays, it's not practiced so much in hospitals, but even still it is. And we were raised to think that being independent was a good thing. If your child is crying, they need some alone time, have them go sit in a corner by themselves, and that's how we raise emotionally stable, balanced children. In fact, the, st the research doesn't point in that direction at all. All the psychological research shows that children who are treated in that way actually are less adjusted psychologically than those who are given more attention, more love, more physical contact. And this way of raising kids is not appropriate to our ultimate health. And this is probably to a great extent why Americans are running around alone, most of them. We don't know how to connect. We don't know how to interact. We don't know how to touch or to show affection and warmth for each other. And it's not our fault. To a great extent, it has been institutionalized. Even, and I don't want to start a brawl here, but, but even the whole movement toward feminism was a government institutionalized movement. It was not something that a woman decided to do just because she wanted to be independent. It was a government funded operation in order so that 50% of Americans who were women who were not paying taxes would actually be paying taxes and so that they can bring our kids into school earlier to indoctrinate them to the governmental philosophy. All of these things contributed to us heading toward a society that's very splintered and separate, where intimate connections are severely lacking. And, and we'll talk later about some of the global impacts of that, because it's not just that you're maybe unhappy or alone or in relationships that are not working for you. It also has a very significant global effect on, on um, hostility and violence and things like that that are going on that would not be going on if we had more secure relationships. Now these are some of the attachment myths. People should be independent. Attachment causes suffering. Children who are coddled <coughs> less grow up more independent and socially adjusted. Adults are more emotionally independent than children. It should be treated as such. And romantic attachment goes against spiritual enlightenment and happiness. I want to clear up the differentiation that we make between young children and adults. We, I think at least today, most of us would agree that children need a little bit more attention and touching and, and human interaction. Uh, 50 years ago, 20 years ago, that was not the case. We, were, we had a very different philosophy. But now, I think most of us, at least societally, have come to understand that that's not the right way to raise kids. But what we don't understand is that human adults are not different than children. We are actually psychologically the same in many ways. So adults actually need the same kind of physical interaction and attention and touching and human contact and love in order to thrive, just as much as children do. And that's something that's very much misunderstood. And another thing I want to explain about attachment, if you attended my lecture last, or you watched it online uh, last time, I talked about attachment to money and material things, and how there is a misunderstanding about attachment to money, where to where, especially those of us of a spiritual conversation, look at it, money as a negative thing, when money is just like the air you breathe. It is when you give it a meaning that you become attached to it. 
And the example I use that I like to use is I'm sitting here breathing the air in this room. I'm not worried that all of you in this room are sucking up all the air and I'm going to pass out, right? That thought doesn't occur to me. I'm just breathing the air in the room. I'm not worried that the air is going to run out. I'm not worried that you're, that because you're breathing, there's less air for me. I'm not worried that I'm not going to have more air in the next moment than I have in this moment. And yet we attribute those qualities to money. We worry or we are jealous of other people who have a lot of money because we think if they have money, then there's not enough for me. Or we look down on people who have money because, because we see that as a negative thing or they must be attached to money because they have a lot of it. The truth is, we can't really know who's attached. There are more spiritual people who are attached to money than there are people who are billionaires. A lot of people with a lot of money are not really attached to money. They breathe it in and out like air. They're not all greedy. But a lot of spiritually minded people who look on money as a negative thing are more attached to money. So it may very well be that there are more spiritually minded people who are attached. But on the other hand, if you could treat money as the air you breathe, Inhale it, exhale it. Don't think about it. Just go about your life. Then you could drive a Lamborghini, live in a mansion, and be not attached to money at all. Or you could be poor on the street and be begging for money and be more attached. In the same way, I want you to look at relationships and the idea of attachment. From an emotional standpoint, we need that attachment. That's a different kind of attachment, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But when attachment causes suffering is when attachment is inappropriate. So when you're hearing your spiritual masters talk about attachment being a bad thing, it's really more about the suffering that comes from it. In a similar way as if I'm attached to money, you can tell because money is causing suffering. I'm paying too much attention to it. I'm worried about how am I going to pay my bills or, or uh, I'm worried about that guy over there who's driving a fancy car and, and why don't I have one? That's attachment to a thing. But if you can simply inhale it and exhale it and experience your life and not really give too much resistance to what it is, then it is not an attachment. You know an area of your life where you have attachment because there is resistance there. If you're suffering in your relationship, then yes, there's attachment there. But relationships don't require suffering, and they can be quite good. When we're talking about attachment in this negative sense, I want you to understand that distinction. Because attachment in the psychological, emotional sense is absolutely necessary for your happiness. And it's a different thing entirely. Are any of you familiar with attachment styles? Have you ever heard of that? Okay, look at you, you just know everything. Psychologists have done a lot of research into different attachment styles. Now these are psychological, emotional attachment styles we're going to talk about now. And what they found was that all people fall into one of three attachment styles. With the exception of some people may have more than one attachment style at a, at a given time. But for the most part, the attachment styles that you have are things that you're born with and that you will have throughout your life. They typically don't change, but they do sometimes. If you are in certain kinds of relationships, they can evolve into other ones. These attachment styles often start in childhood and they're the result of how your parents raised you and how, in particular, your mother and how your mother was toward you, or whoever the primary nurturing parent was, will largely affect your attachment styles throughout your life. So there are three different attachment styles. There's the avoidant attachment style. The avoidant attachment style is, and this is all determined through psychological studies on, uh, on toddlers and, and also adults. What they found was they put toddlers in a room by themselves with their mother and then they asked the mother to leave the room and observed what the child did 
And what they found was the avoidant attachment styles, they got a little upset, but then they basically just did their own thing. They were, they appeared to be relatively unaffected by the mother leaving the room. When the mother came back, they ignored their mother for a period of time. Because, and what that behavior was, is this child was emotionally detaching themselves from the mother. And the reason that, that this child had an avoidant attachment style is because that mother raised them that way. There was a separation. There was not the kind of emotional connection that that child had from that mother. So when the mother left, the child already had a pre-programmed pattern of behavior that said, well, I'm going to be abandoned and that's okay, I'm just going to pretend like it's not going to bother me. And this attachment style carries throughout adulthood to the people we date as we get older. And the vast majority of people in the dating pool are the, these first two attachment styles, the avoidant, which are the ones who are emotionally unavailable. They are actually very deeply hurt and wounded and feeling alone, but they try not to show it. They pretend like they are perfectly happy being alone without any close attachments or connections to anybody. And the, these avoidant attachment styles are quite common in the dating scene. And the next one is the anxious attachment style. Now, you may find their qualities of uh, all of these, or not all of these, but more than one of these in you at certain times. For the most part, though, people don't change. You're one of the three, and and majority of people are one of the three. There are a few exceptions where you may be mostly one and a little bit of another. Uh, Now, if you want to learn more about what these different attachment styles are, there is a book called Attached out there that is that goes really deeply into the the scientific research that was done. It's a very good book. Especially if you're in a relationship with somebody of a certain attachment style, it may give you a way to relate to them and understand how best to show up in that relationship. The anxious attachment style in, in, in toddlers, what they found was when the mother left the room, they had a fit. Uh, they got very emotional. They cried. When the mother came back, they clung to the mother. And they wanted extra affection and love. And so these are children who were raised in an environment where they uh, they didn't receive the kind of affection and love that they wanted. And they responded to it by clinging even more to the parent. Where the avoidant avoid, just simply ignored the parent, pretended like it didn't matter. The anxious attachment style became hyperactive, hypersensitive. And you see this also, this is the other most common attachment style in the dating pool. So the majority of single people out there are anxious or avoidant. And when you join a dating site, those are most likely the people you're going to meet. Because a third attachment style is rarely in the dating pool. So as adults, the anxious attachment style will find that they are um, very hypersensitive to being hurt. They will find themselves in relationships and they already will know that they're unworthy or that they're going to get hurt. And if they, and so they're very sensitive to the slight, the slightest things that the partner that they're with will do that is evidence of them that they need to protect themselves. And so quite often they will get hostile or angry, uh, where the avoidant attachment style doesn't typically get angry. They just ignore and they'll move on to the next one. The uh, avoidant attachment style prefers to have one-night stands without any real close contact because they don't want to get emotionally connected to anyone. That's how they deal with not being hurt. The anxious attachment style becomes hypersensitive and hyper-emotional in order to deal with their feelings of loss. And, And you'll see that quite often. Most of the... People who are in the dating pool are usually anxious and avoidant together. Uh, you'll usually have one person who's anxious, another person avoidant. And which can work, but it can be very volatile because the avoidant ignores and the anxious freaks out when it gets ignored. <laughs> and so you'll have the anxious, very angry and hostile and emotional. And this is not just women. Men, same way. Uh, and you'll have the avoidant who just wants to get away and find somebody else to be with. 
So it can be a very difficult relationship. On the other hand, it can work to some degree. The third and final attachment style is secure. You'll rarely see them in the dating pool because secures are generally pretty confident about themselves. They generally realize their worth and they quite often are not interested in fooling around. They will find a partner. They know exactly what they want. They will find the partner that they want to be with and they'll typically stay with that partner long term. And the reason they're not in the dating pool very often is because they are often in long-term relationships. So they're not often there. And when they do end up in the dating pool, they usually don't stay there very long because before long they'll find a partner that they want to be with and they'll again be in another long-term relationship. The secures are usually pretty confident. They're calm in relationship situations. And so if a secure is with an anxious usually anxious will actually become a secure because the secure person can reassure the anxious person that they're safe and that they're loved. And with a secure person, an anxious person actually feels, becomes secure. That's one case where one type can become another. Uh, sometimes the avoidant can be with a secure. The secure can be with either one of the, the two other types and, and still be okay because a secure is not usually turned off or hurt as much with the avoidant style, even if the avoidant is very distant, because a secure is generally pretty content with who they are, and they know who they are, and they're comfortable with themselves. Secure with another secure is really the best combination of attachment style, uh, and uh, and I get into this a uh, little bit more detail here. So secure with secure is the best because you have two individuals who are very comfortable with themselves. They know how to take care of themselves, but they also are quite comfortable giving love and nurturing to their partner. And when you have two people who are secure, who are in a relationship, you have the best combination. And those are the relationships that tend to last the longest and tend to be the happiest. Going back to our earlier Harvard study, the happiest of the happiest relationships and the happiest of the happiest people were secure, secure relationships. Or secure, anxious can work too in that way. But avoidant can be, can be a challenge. Avoidant and avoidant is not a good combination because you have two people who are emotionally unavailable, who are trying to be together. It doesn't work. They don't know how to express themselves. They don't know how to nurture each other. And that doesn't work. Anxious and anxious could work. It's a little turbulent, but it can work. There, there's some really great psychological books out there. There's one, if, you, if you're in a relationship or you're wanting to be, then you may want to study up on some of these so you can understand what men and women need. Um, there's a, a book called For Men Only, another one called For Women Only, written by the same authors. And it was based on research studies that they did into what men and women actually want to need through surveys and uh, things like that. Let's talk about that for a moment. And, and I want to have a, have a nice quote here from Dr. Sue Johnson, who's written some excellent books, which you may want to check out. She's written two books, Love Sense and Hold Me Tight, which are beautiful books on relationship psychology. She's actually an expert in, uh, in relationship psychology and has written some awesome books in that area. The core of happy relationships is a deep trust that partners matter to each other and will reliably respond when needed. And that's really speaking to a secure relationship. Now let's talk about what women need. And we've got mostly women in the audience. I'm sure you all probably know what you need. And these results were collected by the authors of these books from actual you know, groups of women uh, throughout the United States, I believe is where all the results came from, and, and also men in the United States. So for the men in the audience, any of you know, can you tell me anything that you think that women need? Love. Okay. Anyone else? Protection. Protection, they okay. They need to feel valued. Valued, okay. Actually, you know, you guys are more enlightened than most men. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. There's some good opportunities here for you, know, for you ladies. Most men don't actually have that much of a clue to know that. but uh, So these are some of the things that women need. They need to be loved. Actually, that's the main thing. They need to uh, feel loved and reassured. Uh, women are emotional, 
and they have a hard time. Women, their, their brain activity is very different from men. And so they tend to process multiple things at the same time where us men, we can only do one thing at a time. So our bandwidth is very, very narrow by comparison. We can typically focus on one thing and one thing only, and if something else happens, we get totally derailed. Where women can focus on the baby, and they can be cooking dinner, and they can be on the phone with somebody and texting somebody else, and keep track of all those things. Because their brain activity is very different from men. But at the same time, it does cause them to become more emotionally unstable where men don't have that problem because we don't we can't process that much information in the same way or that many emotions. So one of the things that women need from men is to help them to deal with their emotions and to help them to feel safe and calm. Women want security but not money. They actually money is one part of security, but us men we have our own psychological predisposition to think that money is what matters. But most women who were studied said that they would gladly give up money if they felt more secure in the relationship, meaning they felt more emotionally secure and safe with that person. So safety was really key. And that didn't have to do with money, although money can be one aspect of safety. The majority of women said that they would gladly give up money if it meant that they could have safety without as much money. And I've spoken with a number of women and asked them that question myself, and that's definitely true. So earning is really not as important as we men make it out to be, to most women. And, and a lot of men spend a lot of their time trying to earn money to keep their family going and to pay the bills, thinking that's actually what makes their relationships and the women that they're with the happiest, and in fact, it actually makes the relationship worse. So we need to have some balance there. Uh, and women don't want us to fix stuff. They typically, when women complain about things, it's usually not because they want us to fix it. They usually just want us to listen and shut up. <laughs> Key factor there, the shutting up part. And not necessarily fix things. If they want us to, yeah, just through the dishwasher. <laughs> If women want us to fix something, they will directly ask us to fix something. But most of the time, they just need to vent and to express themselves and to get the emotions out. And they just want us to pay attention, which is very hard for us men to do because we like to fix stuff. And, and it's just a natural thing that a miscommunication or disconnect that happens between men and women because we are fixers and you don't want stuff fixed. And she wants to look attractive. I'm sorry, she doesn't want as much sex. Now, men, uh, we'll get to the men in a second. Men get very upset by this because men think about sex 24-7. And women actually are not as, typically are not as sexually uh, oriented as men. It has nothing to do with whether or not she finds the man she's with attractive or not. It really has to do with women's psychology compared to men. Men typically think about sex way more often than women do. And women are not, whereas men tend to be attracted to a woman sexually because of her physical appearance, women are typically sexually attracted by emotions. If a woman, you could be the sexiest guy, and if she feels unsafe with you, she will not be sexually attracted to you. On the other hand, you could be not attractive at all, but if you make her feel safe and secure and loved, then she will feel sexually attracted to you. So it doesn't really matter how you look. It really actually matters more how you make her feel as far as whether or not she's interested in sex. And, and in most cases, in men, they walk in the door, they're ready to go, and women need some time to warm up. You know? So you have to warm them up emotionally, before you're going to get what you want. And that's just, <laughs> it's just the way it is. Now, there are some exceptions, of course, to every rule, but as a whole, that is the case. So for the men in the audience, it's something you may want to take seriously. Women want to look attractive, and it's, it's not that they want to, when women try to make themselves attractive when they're in a relationship already, it's not because they really care that all the other men and women they run into in the course of their day find them attractive. They're really only interested in the man they're with. 
They want to know that the man that they're with finds them attractive. And, and that's why they go to all that effort. So if they put on a, an outfit and they say, hey, honey, how do I look? And you're like, looks great. Looks same as last week, you know. That's not going to help them feel loved. <laughs> but we as men, we don't take fashion that seriously or, or how women dress or the way they put on their makeup because to us it doesn't really matter. But to them it does because it's a measure of, of whether or not they're loved and whether or not they're safe and whether or not you actually love them. That's all that they care about. And so it's really important that we acknowledge the women they're with and make them feel beautiful because that's a really important factor for them. All right, since we put the, uh, put the heat on the men a minute ago, let's try the women in the audience, see how well you know your men. So what kinds of things do men need in a relationship? Oh, good. That's number one, actually. Number one thing men need is respect. And as a number one thing, most women don't give men. <laughs> yes. If you want your man to give you what you want, you have to give him respect. It is really important. Without that, men don't care about all the other stuff as much as respect. It is the number one most important thing. So it's really key. Men are insecure. You may be surprised to find out. And they need uh, you to help them with those inadequacies. And uh, men are providers too. They really, we, we feel a burden of that. And it could be societal or it could be uh, genetic. But we do feel the need to provide. And like I said earlier, uh, men think about sex 300 times a day. And... Men are, whereas women as a whole are not physically attracted to men, men are physically attracted to women. Men are typically visual in nature. This is why most men, even if they're in a happy relationship, they usually have a hard time avoiding seeing the beautiful girl walking across the street. They, they have, they, because they're visual in nature. And just because they check out another attractive girl does not mean that they don't love you and find you more beautiful. They just, by nature of being visual, are drawn to look at other beautiful women. Uh, whereas women are not. Women actually are not visually oriented as much as men are. And they are not as visually attracted to men as they are emotionally. Men are not as emotionally attracted to women. They're more visually. So they care what you look like. And, uh, and they are quite romantic. Um, but, but they're often quite not quite very comfortable with the fact that they're romantic. So it's an area where you need to help them out. And, and as far as men go in terms of your own physical attraction, if you're in a relationship with a man and he really loves you, he's not comparing you to all the other beautiful women he sees in the streets. He, he just wants to know you're taking care of yourself and you're making an effort to look beautiful. Uh, you don't have to be the prettiest girl in the country or anything like that. You just have to show that you're making an effort to be beautiful for him. So these are some really important psychological differences between men and women that most men and women don't know about each other. And if you knew those things and you just applied those things in your own relationships, or if you start dating and you applied though that understanding to who you're dating, you would make a lot more positive impression on that relationship. Anyone have any questions so far about anything we've talked about? Mm -hmm. What's the relationship? I mean, obviously, some men in this journey have a lot of feminist qualities or feminine qualities. Doesn't mean they're feminine. It just means, and a lot of women have a lot of masculine qualities. Right. I, I mean, in my experience, there's a lot of crossover. I mean, is that a direct relationship as to changing that? Okay, well, actually, the answer to your question is a little bit complicated, and we're going to address some of those things later, but you are right. Uh, it, because our society has sort of flipped the other way, and this is why there, I, one other reason why there are so many people alone, is because men characteristically, and I'm talking about physiologically, should be more testosterone dominant, and women should be more estrogen dominant, which actually would make relationships work better and it also testosterone is better for men's health and and women better are better with estrogen 
And testosterone brings out more of the male qualities, more of those masculine qualities, whereas estrogen brings out more of those feminine qualities. But we're living in a society where a lot of those things have been conditioned out of us through psychological conditioning and also because of our diets and the plastics in our environment. We have estrogen receptors in our brain that, that also respond to xenoestrogens, which are in plastics. So a lot of men are more like women these days because of the estrogens in our environment that are, that are causing us to become more estrogen dominant. I would suggest, and I didn't actually address this in this, in this talk, but that's good. I, that's, I should have done that. I would suggest that men should take measures to increase their testosterone. And it's not just a good idea for relationships because, understand earlier we were talking about women actually rely on men for protection. I don't care how feminist you are. It doesn't matter because there is an underlying psychological need that almost all women have that men need to be more strong. There's no accident that we find Brad, or I shouldn't say me, but you find Brad Pitt hot or you know any number of the male uh, movie stars, you find them attractive because they have those masculine male figures, you know, those male kind of characteristics. And those characteristics are in men who are more testosterone dominant. You can do certain things to increase that. There are Chinese herbs that can be used to increase testosterone, uh, certainly things like uh, sustanch, astragalus will help, uh, but uh, particularly certain ones are better for it than others. I would suggest you either contact a uh, good Chinese herbalist. There's in the United States, there's jingherbs.com. Uh, I, George Lamoureux was at our expo recently. Dragon herbs is also very good. With Chinese herbs, you have to be careful because there's a lot of toxicity in China, so you want to make sure you're dealing with a good, <coughs> reputable company who measures for those things. Otherwise, you may get a lot of heavy metals in the Chinese herbs you use. But there are certain Chinese herbs that will boost your testosterone levels and will bring back more of those male qualities, which are really important. It's not, uh, there's nothing wrong with being a spiritually oriented man, but still being testosterone dominant, because it's good for your health. You'll live longer. You'll live healthier. Um, but but you're right. Those those uh, issues are there with our society these days, and I think it's causing a problem with connection between people. Whereas in more older times, when that wasn't an issue, people got into relationships and they typically stayed together long term in secure, happy relationships. That doesn't happen so much anymore. And there are many factors as to why that is. And we're going to talk later about the effect of the name too, because the name will also, that you, the name that you use, will also increase your testosterone or estrogen levels. And some women who have masculine names will be higher in testosterone and will be more masculine. And that is one way, another way you can, uh, you can uh, adjust your, your femininity or your masculinity. You have a question back there? Typically, well, no, men just end up, men typically, well, healthy men, I should say, uh, are higher in testosterone. If you're younger. Okay. Now, it's, it's, if you're younger, that's possible because younger men, produce a lot of testosterone and they just have more testosterone in their bodies but as they get older especially in the United States testosterone levels in, in men in the United States when they're getting into their 40s are equal to men in more indigenous uh, countries that are in their 90s so there is a huge drop that happens as we get older it's not as much of an issue when you're younger Younger men can probably be okay in American society and be exposed to xenoestrogens and not have that kind of an effect. But it is more of an issue as you get older. Plus, exercise is great too, I forgot to mention. Um, especially for men, muscle building is actually quite great 
for testosterone. Um, if you increase muscle, decrease fat, and men, as we get older, fat is just easier to accumulate and it's harder to get rid of. And as an estrogen, uh, we actually increase our estrogen levels as we increase our body fat. And so for men, being thinner and more muscular as you get older is much better for testosterone. Does that answer your question a little bit? Yeah. What, what, did you need more clarity or? Well, high in one doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be low in the other. But if you're, the environmental factors that are affecting you may lower one or increase the other, then yeah. So you could be testosterone and estrogen fairly equal and then have a lot of xenoestrogens or drink a lot of soy. You mentioned soy earlier, which I forgot to mention is, is also a big factor. And soy is huge in, in, in people who are vegans or in the alternative community. And yet it does increase estrogen levels. So if you consume a lot of soy, you may bring your testosterone levels down to a point where it's severely out of balance with estrogen. And men who tend to be more masculine, who possess those masculine qualities that all you women in the audience love to watch them on movies and things like that. These are big, muscular, manly guys, right? Thor. What's that? Thor. Thor, yes. Uh, that's the other guy I was trying to think of. Thor or Captain America, right? Those kind of guys. They have, they are very muscular, they are very masculine, and they are very testosterone dominant. So, so those are factors that are an issue, yeah. Um, yeah, and exercise is great for women. I mean, exercise is great for both, but it just so happens for men, muscle building is, is, is better for testosterone, but exercise for women is fine. Yeah. Right. She's a, she's a, she's a trainer, by the way. She's actually, she's actually my trainer. So. Yeah. Yeah, it'll do better. There are lots of ways to tackle this. You can change your name. You can take certain Chinese herbs. You can take things like maca, which is a, a root, a uh, plant root that balances hormone levels. It's excellent for men or women to balance hormone levels. Uh, I didn't plan on getting too in depth into hormones, but, but there are lots of great ways to balance your hormone levels. You can exercise. Uh, there, Maybe we can get more in depth into health in another talk and uh, address some of those more specifically. Exercise is great for both, though. It's not a it's not a one or the other. Pesticides increase estrogen. Mm-hmm. Yep. Pesticides do too. So we are <coughs> our our societal issue, our disconnect with relationships and intimacy, is a multifaceted problem. It's not just that we had uh, a CIA finance feminist movement. It's not just that, that we uh, are being marketed to, marketed to in a way that we are disconnected. It's also the soy. It's also the chemtrails that they're spraying in the sky or the chemicals or the Roundup you're spraying on your weeds. All, all of those factors are affecting you so you have to take measures in your life to counteract those things so that you can maintain optimal health in your life and also uh, optimal relationships it's many-sided so let's talk about what our numbers tell us about our partners and about ourselves and this is you'll have if if you brought your piece of paper and pencil you may want to calculate your own numbers if you have not already let's talk about the birthday numerology and this is, if you're unfamiliar with numerology, this is how you calculate your life path number or birth path. Different, different schools of thought call it different things. We'll call it a life path number here. Um, let's say that uh, you were born today, February 11th, 2017. We will add those numbers to 112017 and we'll reduce that to a single digit, which is 5. So children being born today are life path of five. And that tells us a lot about that individual. And reason, so we're going to go into a variety of numerology. 
And in, in everyone's primary numbers, this being one of those primary numbers, the life path number, if you know another person's primary numbers, you have a pretty good idea of how they deal with life, what their personality is like, and whether or not there's somebody you want to be in a relationship with, or if you're already with them, you have a better understanding of how to nurture a better relationship with them, how to deal with issues that may come up, and how they approach their life which may be different from you because your numbers are different. Uh, name room numerology is also another of the primary numbers. Now, your birthday you cannot change. You were born with it. It is was created for you. You chose that birthday in order that you can have a certain kind of life experience this time around. It cannot be changed. It determines what happens year after year after year through the cycles as they come and go and unfold in your life. But the name shows us how you experience those things. And the name will carry a variety of things, such as genetic traits, health conditions, and psychological predispositions. For example, if you're a woman and you've been married in your life once or more, each marriage you're in is going to change who you are. It's also going to pick up different genetic qualities. If you were to, let's say, marry into a family where cancer is a hereditary trait, and you take your husband's surname, then you're likely to be more predisposed to having cancer. If you marry into a family where obesity is a genetic problem, then you're more likely to have uh, to struggle with obesity, even though you didn't before because you took your, the husband's name. The name that you take is going to alter your genetics. It's going to alter your psychological predisposition. It's not just a random name. And so you have to be very conscious of taking someone's surname because it will change who you are. A lot of relationships, perfectly happy couple, high school sweethearts, they get married, she changes their name, and everything goes down the toilet. Because the woman's personality changed when the name changed, and she's no longer the same person that she was in the relationship prior to marriage. And that change alters the dynamics of the whole relationship to where they might have been perfectly fine prior to getting married, but they are not now that they are married. With birthday, what about if it was um, <coughs> like a planned date? A planned date? Yeah, like Yeah, like Doesn't matter. Because you may think that it was induced, but the child and the soul that's coming into this world chose it that way. You chose to be born when you were born. It doesn't matter if you were induced or if you came out naturally. That was supposed to happen so that you could have a certain life experience. And that life experience is there in the numerology and your astrology chart. Yeah? My legal birthday is July 6th, but my mom told me I was actually born until it's to midnight. Okay. So my real birthday would be the 5th, not the 6th. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. Now, in your astrology chart, that's not a factor because two minutes doesn't make any difference. Okay. But, and, and when we look at, and we're going to look at both astrology and numerology today, you have to work them both together to get a more complete picture of your experience, but you would use the, the day before, in your case, for the numerology. Mm-hmm. What if when you have a birthday, you get like a master number, like a 22 or 32? Would you release that? Or would you yeah. Well, that, I didn't really uh, address that too much today because I didn't want to overly complicate this because for those of you who aren't familiar with numerology, it's going to be too complicated as it is. But let's talk about that. <coughs> Briefly, in numerology, typically you will reduce numbers to a single digit, like in the case we just did, we reduced to number five. But in, in some cases, when you reduce the digits, you end up with a double digit. Either 11, 22, or 33 are the main master numbers that most numerologists will consider. And those master numbers will give you added abilities or capabilities in this life. People who are 11s, which is 1 plus 1, is also a 2. People who are 22s is 2 plus 2, which is also 4. And 33s, which is also 6. Those individuals, if you were born with a master number in your primary numbers, then you have the capacity to go beyond the, the single digit version of that number. As, an, as, a, as a two, for example, and we'll talk about what the different numbers mean in a minute. As a two, you, a lot of twos are very selfless people. They are here to serve humanity or to serve others. They're very caring people. Uh, when you take it to an 11, 
Elevens tend to be spiritual leaders and teachers, and they tend to have a higher connection to other dimensions. So a lot of them are highly spiritually gifted in some way. 22s you'll find among a lot of CEOs of companies or multimillionaires, billionaires are 22s, whereas a 4, which is the lower version of that number, they tend to be very responsible, they are hard working, they usually do very well in life, but the 22, if a person rises to that potential, can become highly successful in life versus just living an average life. 33s which is also six, are very family-oriented and loving. But when you, they utilize the 33 part of it, they become, the world becomes their family. So you'll see a lot of 33s who are humanitarians who are trying to bring love into the world as opposed to just their own family. So the master numbers will give certain individuals the capacity to access a higher a part of themselves, a higher capability that that the average person who may not have a master number may not be able to do as easily. Now, that being said, you don't have to have a master number to do something profound in the world. It just makes it easier. And from my experience, a lot of people with master numbers don't actually live up to their potential. They usually, uh, a lot of master numbers actually are, uh, one of the downsides of a master number is there can be hypertension in the body. Because most people with master numbers have an immense amount of energy flowing into their body. And that energy can cause them to become hypertense all the time. And if they don't actually put that energy to work in the world in some way, then that energy will feed back on itself. I often find a, a lot of master numbers who are drug addicts or drink a lot because they're trying to cope with this vast amount of energy. They don't know how to do it. The solution is to actually put it to work in the world. And in doing that, you can cope with that energy and do some big things. Does that answer the question? Sure, so. hmm? Are the master numbers only the double digits 11, 22, 33? You, some numerologists will use the other ones, but I find they're not really that impactful once you get beyond 33. It's the first three are the only ones that I use. I mean, the numbers in between, like 15... Oh, no, those aren't master numbers. We're talking double digits are the only ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. this, these are just some, uh, to give you an idea of how numbers are calculated, we have one through nine, and all the letters below them is how you would calculate your name. And with numerology, now I've studied many different numerology systems, both Eastern and Western systems, some systems that are not Eastern or Western. And every one of them is going to have a slightly different approach to how to calculate numerology. But ultimately, they all work very well together. Numerology and astrology were actually, supposedly originated with Pythagoras. And it was believed that Pythagoras taught these, these tools, among others, to initiates. And at the time, it was in a secret school. No one was allowed to write anything down, so nothing was, was transmitted through writing. It was all verbally, directly from him through his students. And all of his students were at different levels of initiation. Therefore, no one knew all the same things. There were some who were very advanced who knew a lot more, and some who were not so advanced who didn't know as much. When he died, those teachings, which were never written down, went out into the world with all of his students, and splintered off into many different types of, of numerology, astrology, and other kinds of studies, and came back to us now in many forms, Eastern systems, Western systems, Chinese astrology, Western astrology, and so on. What I find is that they all work quite well together if you put them together, and I, so I tend to put them together. And along those lines, some of what I say here today will not make any sense if you talk to another numerologist, because most numerologists will practice one specific form of numerology, and they don't tend to agree with one another 100%, unless you put them together and make them work together, which can really fill in a lot of gaps. Now, in numerology, in the older systems... It was believed that the name that's used the most has the most effect on your life. And I found that to be true, actually. 
In Western numerology, they will calculate your first name, middle name, last name. In most Eastern systems and more ancient systems, you only calculate the name that's used. So if you have a middle name, but you never use it or rarely use it, then you wouldn't really consider that when you're calculating. You would only consider your first name and your last name and the first name more important than the last because you're called that more. On the other hand, let's say your middle name was Joe and your first name was Mary and people will call you Mary Joe. In that case, you would calculate Mary Joe because Joe is used. But if people call you Mary and the Joe is never used or rarely used, then you wouldn't consider the Joe in the calculation. In that case, Mary would be the most important name for you, the most important vibration that affects your life, and your first name, Mary, and whatever last name would be the second most important. So when you're calculating your name, keep that in mind. And, and uh, it's very simple to do, yeah. Well, you're bringing up an, a good point that a lot of people use many variations, and <coughs> what is going to be the most impact in your life is what you're called the most, which you obviously don't use your middle initial right. when you're called, right? right? And when you think of yourself, <laughs> but you sign it. Now, when you sign it, you're also affecting a vibration, which means that that middle initial is part of the vibration that's affecting your life. But to a greater extent, your first name and the last name are going to be more significant. We want to try to use as many, as, as few variations of our name as possible because you actually are going to create a multiple personality issue when you do that because one vibration has a certain personality and another vibration which you sign once in a while is creating a different personality. And the both may clash and most often they do and and that's one way a lot of people end up with psychological issues is that they they don't have a focused name uh so i would suggest if your first name and last name are better than your first name middle name then don't sign your middle initial it may be better for you but that yeah that's something to think about but uh, but in the name that's used the most is the most important. Even if you have a totally different name, for example, actors and actresses often have, st have stage names and everybody knows them by their stage name even though their legal name was never changed. That stage name is going to have the biggest impact if they're known by a lot of people by that name. And the name is not only an effect on, for example, it's like uh, if you were to wear an essential oil. And we know that there are certain essential oils that are calming and other essential oils that have a more of an energizing effect. When you wear them, they calm you down psychologically, physiologically, or the reverse, depending on what you wear. Your name actually is almost like having a permanent essential oil on you because that vibration of your name is having a permanent effect on your experience. If you are called by a certain name, it not only affects what the universe gives you, it also affects how you deal with your life, and it also affects how other people treat you. If your name, for example, is, uh, is a very unapproachable name, people are going to find you unapproachable. On the other hand, if it is a more warm, affectionate, outgoing name, people are going to like you more. So it's a very important decision to make and, and to look at, and some names are just not very good for people. Yeah. Like my name is Christine, but I go by Chris, but people think it's C-H, but it's not. It's okay. mm -hmm. so. That's, it's, it's going to have an effect, but not so much. Because again, the most important is what you think of yourself as and what you call yourself. The written part, written is going to have an effect, but it's not as much of a factor. It would be ideal if it was all in line, though. Because the more variations there are, the more confusion there is in your vibration. So ideally, at some point, you find a name that people know how to spell properly, and, and that's good for you, and just stick with that. Have you ever had someone change the name for one letter? No. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought about it one time, because it's just easier to write out. <laughs> 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 it's too much on my name. It's coming to nominate it. Yeah.
Yeah, that's that's I, I never thought about that. Like like Prince, right? Yeah. <laughs> my name is uh, Laura, but it's L O R A, so my name is spelled all the time. And I find that most people have their name misspelled unless it's like mm-hmm. a common John. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 Ye
One tend to be more action oriented, more direct, and one is one. So one is very self centered, not necessarily intentionally, but ones have a hard time seeing other people and what they're going through because ones are very focused on the self. And so you'll see that in, in individuals who have a lot of one influence in their numbers with no other complementary numbers. They will be very self-centered and they tend to be more hot-headed and more aggressive in their personality. They are leaders. Uh, they don't really like following other people and they start a lot of things, but they don't necessarily finish. Twos are twos. So twos care about the other person, actually. Whereas ones can go off and do their own thing, twos don't typically like to be alone. They like to do things with other people, and they're very much concerned about the other person's experience. So individuals with twos often end up in service-oriented fields because they're very concerned about the well-being of others. And, uh, and they often are passive, they're indecisive. The reason they're indecisive is because if you get a two into a room of people and you ask that to where should we go for dinner, that two is going to ask everyone in that group where should we go for dinner before deciding where to go for dinner. And they cannot make up a mo- their mind on their own. They, they're very dependent on what everybody else thinks and wants. And they're very concerned about making everyone happy. Whereas the one in that situation won't even ask anybody. The one will just say, this is where we're going because this is where I want to go. Uh, that's the, the clear distinction between those two. Threes are very social, outgoing, they tend to have the biggest smiles, they are more lively, they're life of the party. A lot of threes are journalists and actors, writers, public speakers. They tend to have more trouble with commitment. If they have a lot of threes, especially, they're, they have a very hard time. A lot of threes can be disloyal if there are a lot of threes in their numbers. If you have just one three and the other numbers are complementary, it's not so much of a problem. But but it can be an issue with threes. Fours are highly responsible, rigid, logical, stubborn, methodical. They are very slow and steady through life. They often, uh, they're very reliable. So if you need to trust somebody with something, fours are good people to trust. But they tend to be a little bit rigid. They have a very specific structure of how to do things. And they have a hard time just kind of being free to do things in a less structured way. Fives are very anti-structure, actually. Fives are, they tend to be anxious, more high energy. A lot of fives are professional athletes or stuntmen or things, uh, or uh, in extreme sports of some kind. They are highly independent. They don't often make good relationship partners if you want a commitment because fives are restless. They like their freedom. They like variety. And they often have a hard time committing to one partner unless that partner can bring those elements of excitement and variety and freedom into the relationship. Yeah. Is this number for men? Both. These numbers are, you can use them interchangeably. So let's say, and we're going to get to this in a minute, all of you are a combination of different numbers. And so if you are, let's say, a five with a one, that's going to be different or let's say you have a five name, but a one life path, which is your birthday, that's a different person than if you were a six life path and you had a name of three. And part of the nuance of and subtlety of understanding numerology or astrology is learning how to juggle all these different vibrations in your head and translating them into one personality. And I'm hoping to teach you a little bit of that today. Just understand that both elements have to work within the same psychology of the person. The birthday is going to have more to do with what you're experiencing in life. The name will have more weight toward how you go about it. So in that sense, let's say a person was a life path of one, but they had a name of six. The six is going to express more in their personality and how they deal with their life how they deal with the one than the other way around. And that's why you can change, by changing your name, you can actually change your personality. You can change how you deal with your life. So you have a lot of power to, to change how you, uh, how you experience things. So fives are very sporty, they're restless, and they, are, they like variety. 
which is why relationships can be a challenge for a lot of fives. Fives do tend to move a lot too because they don't typically like to stay in one place for very long in the same way as they don't like to be in the same relationship for very long. Unless it's a relationship that brings those elements of newness and excitement into their life. Sixes are family oriented and loving. Um, mother knows what's best. Six is a motherly type of vibration. A lot of sixes are family oriented. If, if you have a lot of sixes, you probably got married at least once. You probably have kids than uh, than some of the other numbers because that's uh, quality. Sixes are more estrogen dominant. They're more feminine. Men with sixes tend to, tend to be more motherly than uh, than uh, men with other numbers. Yes, yeah, more nurturing, more affectionate, warm. More female qualities are in the six, and men who have those have more sixes, tend to have more feminine qualities. Sevens are serious, shy, highly intelligent. They tend to be extremely introverted, especially when they're kids. They are, um, they don't have a lot of friends and they tend to be a bit unapproachable, especially as adults, as they get older. People have a hard time getting close to them. Sevens are very emotional, but they don't know how to express it. In a relationship with a seven, unless you are a complementary vibration, it can be hard because a seven may not know how to show love or warmth or affection, and the partner that's with them will often feel unloved because of that. It's not because the seven doesn't have feelings, it's because the seven doesn't know how to express those feelings. And uh, that's one of the challenges with that. But they are highly intelligent. A lot of sevens are scientists and engineers, and they never stop learning they can be a bit cynical sometimes and they don't smile very much whereas threes tend to wear bright vibrant colors in their life of the party and they often like to sit in the front row the sevens usually wear muted colors they sit in the back of the row and you won't know that they came and went they are very reclusive eights are leaders they're often business owners they can be controlling if there are a lot of eights or if there are other numbers with the eight that like a one, for example, can be a very aggressive, more controlling personality if it's with an eight. Um, but in a, in a positive sense, eights tend to be just leaders and, and the head of organizations or companies. It is a high testosterone number. So it is better for men than for women. If a woman has an eight, she is going to be more masculine, especially if she has a lot of eights. And women with eights tend to have shorter hair, they dress more like men. Quite often, they are in uh, lesbian relationships where they're the male dominant part of the relationship. You'll see that quite often with women in those kinds of relationships. Nines are very selfless, creative, artistic, highly spiritual. They have a hard time functioning in the three-dimensional world because nines are... They have their foot in the cloud, you know, both feet in the clouds quite often, and they are quite often starving artists because they're highly talented, but they don't know how to bring, to do something tangible with that talent in this world. They are very creative. They're very messy. Uh, they like planning parties, but they don't like cleaning after themselves. And uh, they do tend to be humanitarian. A lot of nines end up doing things in the world to help other people because they're very selfless. They're the kind of people who will give you the shirt off their back even if they need it. Uh, and uh, But they are very emotional and sensitive. They easily hurt as a result of that. So changing your name or your partner's name will change your relationship for better or worse. And we talked about this earlier, how if you get married and you change your name not knowing what effect it's going to have, it will have an effect. And it may be positive or it may be negative or it may be neutral. And it's wise for you to understand that before you change your name for any reason, whether it's for marriage or on purpose. And as we said earlier, it has genetic traits as well. Now let's take a look at this. And I, I want you to, and this is where I'm going to put you guys to the test. I hope you memorized that list I just had up there on screen a minute ago. And this is kind of a fun little thing. This is a man. A famous person and I want you to tell me what's this person like and would you want to be in a relationship with them 
Okay, so we have a lot of sixes there. So the first name expression, that's basically the first the person's first name, all the letters calculated together equals six. Their life purpose is the birthday, the whole birthday. The first name soul are the vowels in the first name. So we have three sixes. What is that person like with all those sixes? Family oriented, yeah. What else? This is a man. What did I say about sixes? Estrogen. Estrogen, yes. They're more feminine. They're more estrogen dominant. They're more mothering. They they love kids and family, so they're very into children. So this is a man who is more motherly. Okay, now personality number is, doesn't have a huge impact, so we'll ignore that number. That's more of what they wear on the outside of themselves, but it isn't really a huge part of what they're like. The full name expression is the whole name, first and last name, all the letters, is a seven. What's a seven like? Shy. Shy, good. Intelligent. Mm-hmm, intelligent. Introverted. Sevens also don't like being around people a lot. They're very reclusive. They are not comfortable in groups or social gatherings. They like to keep to themselves. Even if they have a very public role in what they're doing in their lives, they, on their own time, they keep to themselves. They don't, they're not social people. The full name soul is the vowels in the first and last name. What's the four? Responsible. Okay, responsible. Hardworking. Fours are. They're analytical. They're very methodical in what they do. They're method driven. They like structures in their life and, and whatever they're doing for their work, they tend to be very structured in their approach to how to do things. Now, the day of birth is also a big impact. The actual day that they were born, so it's a number two. What is, what do we know about two? Right? They care about other people more than themselves. They're, they tend to be in service oriented fields where they, they feel like they're taking care of other people. So this is a man. Now, but we can assume it's a woman too. Would you want to be in a relationship with this person? Yeah? Why? What was that? Yeah. Okay, good. Intelligent. Oh, oh, intelligent, good. What was you said? Yeah, okay, good. Anyone want to take a guess of who this is? You. No. <laughs> no, no, my numbers are way far off from that. Michael Jackson. Now, you can understand now from this that maybe he was a little misunderstood because he was actually a very loving person. He loved kids, which was obvious. But he was very reclusive. He was not good in crowds. He liked to keep to himself. He overloaded emotionally when he was in big groups of people, which is why he had his Neverland Ranch, and he kind of was this reclusive person in his own time. But he was highly creative, but his creativity was very structured. He created things that were uh, that took a lot of work and followed a certain process. And he was interested in helping other people. So this is an individual who is very warm and affectionate and motherly. And if anything, he was unapproachable because of that seven. People did not get close to him. He didn't let a lot of people get very close to him. He probably had a handful of a few friends that he trusted, but he didn't have very many people in his life otherwise. Okay, let's look at another one. What about this person? We have a first name expression of three. What's that? Life of the party, yeah, okay. Smiles a lot. Mm-hmm. Outgoing, yep. Life purpose five. Travel. Travel, okay. Reckless. Reckless, I'm yeah. Five. You're a five, okay. <laughs> I forgot that. Yeah. So they're reckless, they are high energy, they like extreme sports, they're excitable, they are not particularly great in relationships, but they are very unconventional in their life because fives don't like to do what everybody else does. And now this is a female. First name soul is one. What's the one? Aggressive. What? Aggressive? Cares, about Cares about themselves. Okay. Leaders. Leaders. Very direct. Mm-hmm. 
a little self-centered. Now, uh, what about the full name expression is all the letters in the first and last name, and the day of birth is also an eight. So we have two eights in this person's main numbers, which makes it a very dominant vibration in their life. What was an eight? Right. Controlling. Controlling. More masculine. So there's a woman who's masculine. So what did I talk about? What did I say about women who had eights and who were more masculine? What kind of qualities did they have? Short hair, yes. Okay. Full name soul, which is the vowels in the first and last name. What can we say about the seven? Highly intelligent, yeah. Shy. Shy. Unapproachable. Okay. Now, the first name expressions are three, so they are actually lively and outgoing. So how do we make those two work together? Because they're very different. Sevens are shy and reclusive. Threes are outgoing and lively. This is a person who is probably a very good show, show person. They are good in front of audiences, they're very lively and wild and life of the party, but they don't really like being around people that much. Yes. Look at that. That's very impressive. That was Ellen DeGeneres. Would you date that person? She does have money. And eights actually, that's another thing I forgot. Eights are business owners. They make a lot, they usually are very success driven. So as a woman, she, she is very driven to succeed as an eight. But you can see the masculine qualities in there, right? Okay, I'll give you another one. Here's another one. First name expression of nine. What's that person like? That's the full, that's the first name, all the letters. Spiritual, Spiritual selfless. Creative, humanitarian. Uh-huh. Artistic, probably. Messy, yeah. All right, and we have two nines there. We also have the first name vowels are also a nine. So the nine is a big part of this person's personality. So humanitarianism, selflessness, spirituality, those are all part of that person's personality. Life purpose of five, what can we say about that? You're a five, you should know. <laughs> Crazy. Crazy. Fun. Crazy, fun, lively, energetic, reckless. What else? Likes to travel. Independent. Not particularly great in marriage. Doesn't mean it's impossible, though. With the right partner, this, even a five could be okay. But the uh, But there's a tendency to want freedom and variety and excitement. And unless they find a partner who can give them that, they often aren't very good in relationships. First name, soul of seven. That's the vowels in the first name. What can we say about that? Shy. Shy. Introverted, unapproachable. Yeah, good. And the day of birth is a four. What's a four? Organized, process-oriented, a bit rigid. Would you date this person? Would you want to be in a relationship with this person? Quite a mix. Of, I mean, this is what typically people are, right? They have a whole variety of blends of numbers. And this is a case where maybe a different name would be good because... She's got such a mixture of things that a, another name might create more balance and stability for this person. And nine with a five can be highly emotional. So this person, because the five is very excitable and the nine is very emotional, you have a person, and especially it's a woman, who tend to be more emotional anyway. This is a woman who is extremely emotional. This is a famous person, though. No? What do you think? Guys, would you want to be with a girl like that? No? <laughs> you may change your mind when you find out who it is. Any guesses? Yes. God, you guys are on the ball. I'm impressed. It's out of the video. No, first time I've had this one on here. Okay, so that's Angela Jolie. And we can see the humanitarianism, right, with her adopting all the children and things like that. And she travels a lot. She's 
high energy, reckless. She plays uh, a lot of roles where she is shooting things and blowing stuff up, right? That's She has that kind of persona. Yeah, I think this is the last one. What about this person? It's a male. First name expression is a one. And the full name expression is a one. So we have two ones in the main numbers and we have two fives. So we have, so one and five is a huge, this person is very, very much focused in that area. They would be wise to change their name because that's a lot of energy in one particular area. What do you think? What's a one and a five? Mm-hmm. <laughs> what else? Mm-hmm. This is where you have to uh, get good at combining numbers. When you have the one and the five together, you get a person who is very volatile, violent, um, aggressive, extremely aggressive, because not only do they have this anxious, excitable um, energy, but they also are very direct and, and angry and self-centered. So you have somebody who's got some issues with violence with this combination of numbers. They would be wise to change that name. Full name, soul of three. What's that? Okay, life of the party, outgoing. First name, soul of six. What's that? Family. Family, right? Love, loving. So there's some love and warmth in there, but it's probably overshadowed by all that one and five. This is a case where you have a combination of numbers, but there's so much in one area that you may not even see those other qualities. They're there, though. So this person actually is very loving and affectionate, but you would never be able to tell because, or in rare cases, maybe people who really know this person closely would be able to tell that he's very loving, but the majority of people wouldn't see it because... His personality is largely influenced by that one and the five, which is very aggressive. Any thoughts? No, but he is very aggressive. I haven't looked at his. What's that? No. Ask your What's that? Would the ladies like to marry? Would the lady? Would you? Uh, yeah. Would. Kanye. <laughs> That's actually pretty good too. But no, you're on the right track. So no one want to marry this guy. So this is why when you go on a date, you want to make sure you have their name and their birthday, right? <laughs> when you're going through the dating sites, you want to you want to make sure you rule out the ones that you don't want, and and maybe that's something you can learn from this experience. That's Bobby Brown. Okay, are you starting to get a feel for how these work? Okay, yeah. So. I know of somebody who is the date of birth like the lesser of the effects. I know somebody who is basically the polar opposite of uh, what this is saying mm -hmm. for the date of birth. Oh, for the with the numbers? Yeah. Well, this is where it gets complicated because we want to look at the astrology chart as well. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But if if, let's say, for example, the astrology chart makes someone very soft and gentle, but their name is very aggressive, that's going to have an effect as well. But as a whole, most people who have names that are aggressive are just aggressive, and you'll see those things in the chart as well. There are rare cases, though, like you're talking about, where the, the vibrations in the astrology chart kind of counteract the name, and to some extent, it may mitigate for those other influences. So it's an area of study that's, it gets a pretty, it's, I, for the sake of our talk here today, I tried to keep things as simple as possible so you would all understand how these tools work. But if you want to really understand this, you should take up a study of astrology and numerology and get good at combining the different things to understand how they work together. Okay. So this is, really important because if you're in a relationship with somebody now, then as the years come and go, the vibration of the year that they're in will change and their, what they're experiencing in their life will change, 
how they're experiencing, their emotional state will change. If you know what that is, then you'll know how to adjust to that. And you'll know that some years they're just going to be under more stress. And rather than causing more problems for them, maybe you could be more supportive. Or other years, they may be going through a lot of transitions in their lives and, and, and maybe you can be more supportive of that. So knowing what the year number is is really important. Calculating the personal year is similar to how we calculated your birthday earlier, your life path, except instead of the year of your birth, you're going to use the year of your last birthday and the same for your partner. So in this case, if this person was born April 11, 2016, then we would use 2016, I'm sorry, if their birthday was April 11th and 2016 was their last birthday, maybe they were born April 11th, 1975. But we're not concerned with the 1975 because we want to know what year they're currently in. And for that reason, we would use the year of their last birthday in the calculation. And in this case, it comes out to six. So this person, regardless of when they were born, they're currently in year six. And knowing that, we know where they are in the timeline of nine-year cycles, and we kind of know their emotional state. And this is where somebody who may be a one, for example, or let's say Bobby Brown, who's a one-five, if he happens to be in a number six year, he's going to be more nurturing in that year and less aggressive because that six vibration has a more significant effect. On the other hand, if he was in a number one or a number five year, being a one and a five, he's probably going to be more hostile in those years. And you, if you know that, then you know that those tendencies that that person has in their own birth numbers will become more pronounced in the years that match those numbers. Now let's take a look at what those new numbers mean. And uh, these are the nine numbers. So the one is a new beginning. We go through nine-year cycles. Every nine years, the cycle starts over with number one. And when a person is in number one year, they're starting their life over. Uh, and as that's happening, that person probably in the last year and a half has lost things in their life. Oftentimes, people will quit jobs. They'll move somewhere. They'll often lose loved ones. They, If they're in good relationships, they may be making a positive transition. Maybe they just got married in the past year. They may have had their first child in the past year. But what we know is they're, they're in a new beginning phase of their life. They don't really know. They're not yet comfortable with this new cycle that they're in because everything has just started over for them. And so they're in this unknown period of their, their life. They can be a little bit more aggressive. If you're with somebody who ordinarily is pretty easygoing, but they go, they're go. they going into one year, they probably are going to become a little bit more direct, a little bit more of an edge to them, a little bit more aggressive. If they were born with ones and fives or something more aggressive, they're probably going to become extremely volatile in the one year. And uh, that's one way to prepare for that. You'll know that that's coming before it comes. And either you'll know that you need to support your partner in that way, and give them the freedom to do those things. And they're also going to be more self-centered. If you're with a partner who's in a one year, they are going to be more self-centered in that one year than they ordinarily are. And they may not consider you in what they're thinking. They can't help it. You'll do the same thing when you're in your one year. Number two is more of a caring year where we are more concerned with other people. It's a more passive, selfless year. People who are in twos are usually a lot, very easy to get along with, unless if their primary numbers are more aggressive and they're still going to have that, but at least they'll become a little easier to deal with. Three years, people tend to become more social, more outgoing. If you're single, you will probably date and get opportunities to be in relationships in a three year, although relationships that happen in a three year often don't last unless they carry forward into the four year. A lot of relationships start and end in a three year because it's a year where there isn't necessarily relationship stability, but there are opportunities to have that. Yeah. In your previous slide, you had 2016. No, what, um, it was April 11, 2016. And when you're calculating the year number, you're going to use the last birthday. Okay. Mm -hmm. The last birthday, or the, I'm sorry, the most recent birthday, which in this case, April 11 didn't happen yet this year. So we would use 2016. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, number three years, there can be disloyalty if you're in a relationship with somebody, especially if they have threes in their numbers or fives in their primary numbers. A lot of cheating happens in three years uh, because uh, opportunities to be in other relationships show up, and especially if a person is not a more secure attachment style. Let's say you're with an avoidant attachment style in a number three year. You can pretty much count on them being disloyal. This is where... The psychology works very well with the numerology, whereas a secure attachment style in a three-year would not typically do that, unless they're extremely miserable in the relationship. A secure attachment style will be very loyal even in a three-year. They, even if they probably will have opportunities to be in relationships, but they generally wouldn't take them. And so we have to understand that we're not using numerology inside of a bubble. The psychological tendencies of the person will dictate how they deal with these numbers. Now, in three years, three years are one of the more challenging years. And and one thing I probably, I confuse a lot of people at the last lecture because in the span of the three-hour period of time, I can't uh, download 23 years of research and study into your heads. So I try to simplify things and sometimes it causes a little bit of confusion. And as you were asking earlier about whether we use 2016 or 2017 in calculating the year number, you would use the last birthday, but you want to understand that the numerology of the year does not turn on a dime. It isn't like, for example, night doesn't turn into day in a split second. It happens gradually over time. In the same way, let's say your birthday was in April. You and you're going into a number three year in April. You're going to notice that vibration of the three, even the previous fall. So it is gradually coming in. And in fact, the worst part of that three, even though it didn't happen till your birthday, in April will probably be December to January of that transition from the previous year. So when you're calculating your your year number, keep in mind that that vibration has already been coming in about six months prior to your birthday happening. It's slowly easing in, and then once your birthday happens, it slowly eases out into the next year. Keep that and keep that in mind. It'll alleviate some of the confusion. Four year. There and the first three years, if a person is in the first three years, they usually have just started over their life in a new direction and things are not quite set yet. They, they're not quite certain where they're going. It's a number four year that our path becomes more concrete and we have an idea of what we're doing and where we're going in our lives. The four year through the nine year, or I'm sorry, through the um, eight year, middle of the eight year, is when people achieve the most in their life. They usually get promoted and they get a lot more opportunities for work or whatever it is that they're doing. And in, we talked about this more in the last lecture about if you want to pursue a career path in some spiritual field, then the best time to really put effort into it is the four through middle of the eight because the vibrations will support your success versus the years previous when the energies are just starting to come in and doesn't move as fast. Four year, or there are more responsibilities. People often work extremely hard. They, a lot of people work multiple jobs in a four year, or there are other responsibilities that are put on their shoulders. So it can be uh, a very demanding year. Five year, many changes. If you are in a particular line of work, your growth will accelerate exponentially in the five year. It can cause stress. Many people will travel or move in a five year. So if you're with a partner who's in a five, you can understand they're probably under stress because of whatever is going on in their life. If you're not in a happy relationship with somebody who's in a five year, that stress will happen in the relationship most often. And for that reason, a lot of relationships break up in a five because the relationship is already unstable and not going well. Now, in a relationship that's going well, in a five year, you will often see wedding planning happening which is chaotic and stressful. And you will often see pregnancy happening in the five year, which is chaotic and stressful. So that's a positive use of the five, but, but the experience of the stress is still there regardless. It's just a matter of how it manifests in that person's life. For example, getting back to, again, the attachment styles, a secure person in a five year probably isn't going to leave their partner they probably are going through some kind of stress in that relationship. 
or outside of the relationship that's causing stress in the relationship and they'll deal with it and work through it and move on. Uh, an avoidant person in a five year is probably leaving a relationship wanting to start a new one which happens in the sixth year. A lot of people will start new relationships in the sixth year. There'll be opportunities for relationships in a sixth year. More often you'll see long-term relationship opportunities starting in the sixth year or in the number one year. Not so much in the three year. That's usually three year relationships don't have the glue to last. But they're fun though. Three year relationships tend to be fun, exciting, uh, highly sexual, but they don't have the glue quite often for commitment. Six years tend to, children are born in the six year, it's a loving year, love oriented, heart centered. A lot of children are born at that time, weddings happen in six years. And moving on to the seven year, and it tends to be a highly successful year too. People tend to experience a lot of success in the six, seven, and through the eight. Moving on to the seven year, this is why a lot of women experience postpartum depression because they often have their children in the sixth year and then they're going into a seven year where there's depression. In the seven year, there can be separation, loneliness, depression, and even if you're in a good relationship, often in a seven year, your partner is not there. Maybe they had to travel or they're working a lot or you're working a lot, in which case you don't have as much emotional contact. So there can be some loneliness whether it is imposed on you or by your own choice. Uh, quite often in a seven year, people just don't want to be around people as much. They just want to be that by themselves and they can become more sensitive to their environments and antisocial in a seven, whereas a three is very outgoing and social. Eight is the peak of this of the success cycle. When you get to the eight, most pa often whatever life direction you were going reaches a culmination at that time. A lot of promotions will happen in the eight year. You may have reached a peak in whatever career path you were following up to that point and in the year that follows that direction will start to come to an end as you prepare for the next phase of your life. So in the eight year quite often people are a little bit uncertain where they're going because especially the latter part of the eight year because where they've been going for the whole nine year cycle starts to level off necessarily so because they're meant to go in another direction in the next nine years and uh, there can be concerns eight has to do with money as well there can be financial concerns in the eight year many people take on more financial burdens in the eight year and more expenses you can tend to spend more and uh, the eight year also people tend to become a bit and especially based on how your primary numbers are They tend to become a little bit more bullheaded and aggressive not aggressive in a mean way always But more dominant because eight is a very testosterone oriented number people can become more masculine and more stubborn and more um, domineering if they have a lot of other eights in their main numbers especially so if you're with a partner in an eight, they'll probably become a little bit more bullheaded and harder to move, you know, harder to, they'll become more inflexible in the eight. On the other hand, eight are, eight's a very sexual number. Eights tend to, your sex drive will increase dramatically in the eight year, and um, that's potentially a positive if you have a good relationship to, as an outlet for that. In the nine year, we are ending the cycle again. Getting ready to start a new one. So you're saying men are always in peak? No, I mean, men are more testosterone. Well, characteristically, they should be. In our society, it's not true. But if you have an eight as your number, then yes, you're going to be, have, be more testosterone. You're going to have more masculine qualities all along. And as long as they're not out of balance, some men who have numbers out of balance and have too much of the eight can be very domineering and that can be a problem. Too much testosterone, too much aggressive energy. Nine is people tend to be drawn to spiritual things in the nine. It's a great year. In a nine year, you'll have a hard time manifesting in the three-dimensional world. So if you're trying to create a new career path or something, it can be hard in the nine. But it's a great year to do something spiritual because the universe will support you in your own development. 
a lot of people have spiritual awakenings in their nine year because that aspect of our human development is highly enhanced and charged in the nine year. If you're in a nine year, I would suggest taking up spiritual practices, any kind of spiritual practice that's going to enhance your consciousness or help you to grow inside. Nine people like to travel because it's the end of a cycle. Many people will move in a nine year. Their lives will tend to be in a state of uncertainty. A lot of relationships will come to an end, careers will come to an end. All necessary because your life is preparing you for a new direction. But people do tend to become softer in a nine. More emotional, but more soft, more caring, less aggressive in a nine. Contrary to the eight where they're very stubborn, in the nine they're much more passive and more yielding. Any questions about any of these numbers or anything? So if your birth and your personal year is the same, does that have any special meaning or just it? Yes, if your birth number and uh, is a particular number and the year comes, six six. then that means that, that the year that you're in right now is very important to why you came here. Things in this year are especially significant to your evolution as a soul in this incarnation. <laughs> yeah. Any advice going on in the last five months of my life? Any advice to whether to do a spiritual practice that you need to push forward towards my spiritual life or my learning? Yes. Well, let me address the spiritual first. The reason you want to focus on the spiritual in the nine is because if you do and you have an awakening or an, or in some way enhance your inner development in the nine year, you're going to go into the next nine year cycle a very different person. Versus if you don't do that, then you kind of go into the next nine years the same as you were before, but having new experiences. So the nine year gives you an opportunity to elevate yourself to another level of experience so that you can experience the next phase of your life from an entirely different vantage point, from as an entirely different person than you were before. So that's one benefit to doing that. The thing that I want to make clear is that we as human beings, we all have egoic expression, which is necessary for our three-dimensional experience. But it can cause some challenges because we have a tendency to want things to be a certain way when we want them that way. And it's hard for us to be passive and just let things be. And one of the hardest things that people experience in the nine is their unwillingness to be unattached to the things that are going. In a nine year, oftentimes many things fall away from our lives, whether it's material things or people, relationships, it could be loved ones in one way or another. A lot of deaths will happen in a nine year. Uh, and we have a tendency to, to hold on too tightly to things in the nine year that will not stay with us. And, and doing that can cause a lot of suffering. One advice I would say is in the nine year, be willing to let go of anything that looks like it's trying to go. It's not meant for you to keep for the next nine years, and in keeping it, it will just hold you back. So one of the things I would say is be willing to let go. And also, be patient because at the end of the nine year, you're going to start noticing the new things starting to come into your life. New relationships, new interests, the new path will start to unfold at the very end of the nine year, but it won't be very clear what that is yet. You'll, you have to get to your birthday in your number two year before you can look back and say, oh yeah, it makes sense now. But all the while, from the end of the nine year all the way to your birthday, the two year, that new direction was always taking shape. You just didn't know and you weren't paying attention. And if you try to figure it out, you're not going to make sense of it. But in hindsight, when you get to the two year, the, that new path is, all, is pretty much set in stone. And you can look back and, and make sense of where you've come. So my advice would be, be patient through the nine year. Don't try to force anything. Because chances are, what you try to create, if you're at the beginning of the nine year especially, what you try to create will not last. Speaking for myself, when I was now, I've studied numerology and astrology forever. And... Yet, I still do dumb things and that I know I shouldn't do. And in my last nine year, I know, I knew that chances are what I'm trying to do in the nine year isn't going to work out. 
But nonetheless, I had nothing else to do, so I decided to do it anyway. And I started two brand new companies in the nine year. Spent a ton of effort and money and time in developing these perfect brands. And and because my former life, I was former life, meaning prior to this phase of my life, I was very focused in the business and financial world. And that was my universe. That was my life experience. And I tried to create new <coughs> life direction from the vantage point of who I had been, thinking that this is what I was going to do. But the problem with that is I didn't know who I was going to be becoming yet. And it isn't possible for me to create for a future when I'm not the person I needed to be in order to create for that future. And in the end, those two things I started, I ended up doing nothing with. Uh, I realized by the time my one year came around that I could not go in that direction anymore. And I had a spiritual awakening in my nine year that, that was a cause of that awareness. And once I had that awakening, I realized that I had to go in this direction and I couldn't go back to that world anymore. So you have to keep in mind that you don't know yet what you don't know yet, and you have to be patient until until those pieces start coming into place, and it's very hard for us as human beings to be patient and wait for that. But it will work out. Start paying attention to the new things that are coming into your life, the new interests, new people, because those are probably pointing you in the direction of where you need to go. For me personally, I started this organization at the very end of my nine year. But it didn't look anything like this. It was just a crazy idea at the time. And, and, I, and I just started putting the first pieces of it into place. Now it's grown into something much bigger. But I couldn't have, even with knowing cycles and everything that I do know, I couldn't have imagined then that this is what it would be. Uh, but it all started at that time. So you're at that place right now where it's starting to start, but it's very early. Yeah. Do you have somebody else have a question? So given that we just completed 2016, which was nine years, mm -hmm. and we're in 2017 as a one year, can you also use the same psychology that when we're in a two to three year, in a few years, in hindsight, we'll be able to look back. Mm -hmm. Globally? And, and from a global perspective, mm -hmm. and we will be able to say, oh, that's why the world is so crazy? Yes, no. well, I can't speak to the crazy, but yes. <laughs> well, you yes. know what I mean. Yes. <laughs> you are right. So tumultuous. Yeah, from a global perspective, we just started a whole new direction. And while some of you may have voted for Trump and some of you didn't and other things going on in the world that are happening newly this year, they are actually a brand new direction that has not happened for nine years. And you will become aware of it in, in, within a couple of few years. You'll be able to look back and say, oh yeah, that all started there on a global level. But you're not, at this point... You're not yet far enough into the new cycle to be able to see on a global level what world we're headed into. It will be a different one, though. And you can, I mean, even from our president alone, we have never had a president like that before in many respects, uh, although it's probably the same people pulling the strings behind the scenes anyway. But, but there obviously is a new direction that's unfolding, and we can't yet know what that direction is. Just based on the numbers, it is a new direction. Okay. In personal years, is that a calculation with month, day, you know, the, the year you're analyzing? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't your personal year be just a cycle of nine from the year you're born and, and then the first year, your second year, your third year? No, it actually is based on what your life path is when you're born. Mm -hmm. So if you were born a life path of two, then your first year would be a two, your next year would be a three, and so on. If you're born a life path of nine, then your first year would be a nine, your next year would be a one and two. So it varies based on when you were born. Make sense? <laughs> well, this is why we're all unique. If we were all born in year number one, then we'd all be having a much more similar experience, but we're all unique expressions of consciousness. And our birthdays give us that one element of that uniqueness. Okay, now... 
the happiest relationships are a combination of psych, and we touched on this earlier, a combination of psychological and vibrational compatibility. And we talked about the psychological already, the attachment styles and what men and women want and need from each other. And we also talked a little bit about the vibrational elements in the numerology. And I don't want you to single out either one of those as being more important than the other because actually, from my experience in studying people for many years, I find that the psychology has a big influence as well as the vibrations. If, for example, and you brought up your friend a minute ago, if, for example, a person has a vibrational influence, meaning let's just use their numerology as an example of vibrational influence, that is one way, but their psychological Im influence is different, then they are going to be a blend between the two. Most often when you see numerology, like let's say in this case of Bobby Brown, who's very aggressive personality, in most cases that person had a very aggressive childhood. And so they were psychologically predisposed to aggression, and the numerology just made it that much worse. Now, he could just as well have been born in a household where it was very warm and affectionate and where they taught him how to manage his emotions and not be hostile, in which case he could have those same numbers and not be such an extreme case of violent uh, behavior. This is where we have to now add the psychological tendency. And that's why I said earlier, a person who is a three and a five is probably never going to settle down, or if they do, they're going to be in and out of many marriages and relationships because that's not a very loyal combination. It's not a very stable combination for relationships. On the other hand, if they were raised in a, in a household with very secure attachment styles, with parents that stayed married and had a very loving relationship, they probably won't behave that way when they get older. They may have a tendency toward it, but they will probably be some combination of the two. They could go through a couple of relationships that don't work, or they may be the one who's a secure attachment style, but they tend to attract partners who are not very loyal. This is where we have to look at that, because quite often you'll see that where a person has a secure attachment style, but they may attract partners who are not, and so they could go through many relationships. So that number combination will express itself outside of themselves as opposed to inside of themselves psychologically. So the ideal combinations are some combination of the two. But that being said, there are certain vibrations in numerology and astrology that are extremely reliable in determining how well a relationship will go. If you have them in your relationship chart with your partner, chances are it's, your relationship will be very easy. If you don't, then your relationship will be harder. For most of us, we fall somewhere in between from what's ideal and what's terrible, and and we just have to work a little bit harder than what's ideal. I've used uh, some examples here that we'll look look at in a minute. Now, in astrological astrological compatibility is extremely extremely accurate, m way more than numerology, and it's much more than I can teach you in a simple conversation. But we'll touch on some basic concepts. So now, you when you go on a date, you can ask your partner for their astrology chart and you'll be armed and dangerous enough to know how to pick the right person. And what I found, is, and a lot of astrologers will say that you want to have certain kinds of influences to have the best relationship. They're not entirely wrong, but my experience has been, and I've looked at hundreds of relationships of people, who some good, some bad, and what I found is it's the absence of certain negative influences, actually, that you want to go for, as opposed to the presence of the positive ones. If you have both, that's great. But you don't have to have both to have a good relationship. If you have both, then you have to work less hard to make the relationship great. It'll just naturally be great. And on top of that, if you have the right psychological uh, style, then it's even easier. But if you get into a relationship with somebody and certain influences are absent that are difficult, then you'll probably have a pretty good opportunity to make it a good relationship anyway. And that's what we're going to focus on a bit here. These are some of the most adverse alignments, and I know it's not going to make any sense to any of you guys, but I'll try to illustrate the best way I can. 
And this is, I don't want to get too heavy into astrology because, like I said, it's very complicated if you haven't already studied it. It's going to look like gibberish on a screen to you. But these are some of the alignments that we want to avoid in our chart alignments with our partners. If you are with somebody now and you have these things in abundance, then it probably isn't very easy for you in that relationship to maintain happiness and love. The most significant adverse influences that I see in the worst relationships are Saturn, Venus, opposition, squares, conjunctions. In astrology, an opposition is when two planets are 180 degrees apart. Squares, they're 90 degrees apart. Conjunctions, they're zero degrees, so they're in the same place. So when we use the terminology opposition, squares, conjunctions, that's what that means. So when you see Saturn and Venus in the, those alignments, Venus has to do with love and warmth and affection and also affects money. Saturn tends to restrict things when it's in a harsh influence like those. When you put those two together, you have a relationship where there is a difficulty to express warmth and love. And there's usually a coldness between the two people. And when I see that in charts between two people, it's very hard to overcome that, especially if there are more, it's more than one adverse influence. Another one, Saturn opposition or square conjunction to the sun, meaning in one person's chart you have the Saturn, in another person's chart you have the sun that's at 90 degrees or 180 degrees or at zero degrees to the other person's chart. So you're, you're taking one person's and comparing, comparing where is it here where is it there and mm -hmm. how is it? yes you're overlapping the two you're looking at how does one person affect the other person and in this in the earlier one where i said saturn venus we're looking at saturn in one chart venus in the other chart and seeing how they compare and when they line up in those certain ways it can cause problems when you see saturn sun influences like that what you end up with is two people who kind of feel stuck together the they may stay in a relationship long term even though they're kind of miserable you'll see that in a lot of long term marriages that just don't break up even though they're sleeping in separate beds and quite often they're in the marriage or relationship out of responsibility or practical reasons i'll show you some examples in a minute for example maybe they're they're they own a business together or they are raising children and they feel like for the good of the kids, we're going to stay together. And you'll see a lot of Saturn-Sun alignments like that in relationships where they're together out of responsibility to something or out of practical reasons and not necessarily out of happiness. There can also be a tendency for their to, one partner to restrict the other person's freedom when you have a Saturn-Sun alignment like that. There are Saturn-Venus and Saturn-Sun alignments that are positive to a relationship, but they are not opposition squares or conjunctions. Saturn moon opposition squares conjunctions can, the moon in a person's chart affects their emotional state. So when you have a Saturn alignment to that, one person <coughs> makes the other one feel emotionally shut down. And there can be a coldness in the relationship and a lack of nurturing. And uh, I, sometimes in good relationships, you'll see Saturn moon, but all the other things are positive. So in that relationship, there may be a little bit lacking of warmth, but if other elements are better, then it it won't be overwhelming. Uranus Sun influences opposition squares conjunctions. It actually, the problem there is there can be a lack of glue. In those relationships, they don't last very long. People can break up very easily in Uranus Sun alignments. You will see that in the charts a lot of times of women who are dating younger men. Is Uranus is excitement and it's lively and energetic and, and the sun in a woman's chart will represent the man she's with. So you'll see women with younger men with Uranus moon or men with Uranus moon will be with younger women. This is why what the midlife crisis, we all talk about it about age 40, there, it's a Uranus opposition. Planet Uranus is opposite itself in your own chart at about that age. And this is why a lot of relationships break up and the couple goes and dates younger people or gets sports cars or, or 
breast enlargements or whatever, you know, <laughs> because Uranus makes us want to be youthful and energized again and energetic and be with younger people. And um, Uranus-Mars oppositions by themselves are not bad, but they can create more violence in a relationship. Same with Mars-Pluto can be more violence in the relationship. Mars-Sun, same thing. Mars-Moon can be violence. It can also be heartbreak if you have a Mars-Moon harsh alignment with your partner. There may be an undercurrent of discomfort in the relationship. One person's emotional state really seriously injures the other one. And there can be a constant state of uh, heartbreak or sadness. If that alignment is moving through your own chart temporarily, you may have a heartbreak of your own. And I find that uh, Mars Moon you'll see in a lot of heartbreak situations. Which, by the way, I didn't really include this in this talk, but it just popped into my head. Um, the heartbreak we can measure that in in our uh, in our brain activity, and quite often people use Tylenol to mitigate heartbreak because Tylenol reacts with the same receptors in the in the brain as heartbreak, uh, as uh, or counteracts that effect, and. So if somebody is going through heartbreak, Tylenol is actually one effective way to temporarily suppress the feelings of heartbreak until you can manage it on your own. And it's very commonly known in psychology. So very, and a little fun fact there. With Neptune square... The, what's that? You should have known before? Should known before? <laughs> yes. It is very helpful. Neptune, Sun, squares, and oppositions, it, that can create confusion and illusions in relationships. I see that very often in a woman's chart. When I see that in a woman's chart, she'll make bad choices in men because women, in women's chart, the Sun represents the man that she's a- attracted to. And when Neptune is in a square or an opposition in her own chart or with the partner that she's with, she usually isn't seeing for who he is, seeing him for who he is, and it won't be until it's too late that she sees the flaws or the problems, and it often is very difficult to change at that point. That's not a really harsh thing, but it can cause some problems. Saturn, Venus, trines, and sextiles. These are the harmonious alignments between charts, and what we see here are some of the things we want to see in a chart. But again, if you didn't have any of these, but you did also didn't have any of, or very much of the harsh alignments, it's not a problem. So don't go out on dates and ask for astrology charts and say, oh, you don't have any of these positive things. And <laughs> Ethan said, I can't be with you. That's not really true. If you, I find that there are a lot of relationships that don't have these things or have some, just a few of them to where it's not a big thing, part of their alignments, but they also don't have the harsh elements. The harsh elements make it very hard for you to maintain a positive relationship. If you just remove that, it just takes a little work, but it's it can be done. These, though, if you have these, in addition to not having too many negative influences, this can really make for an amazing relationship that can last a long time to where you feel very secure and loved, even if your attachment style wasn't particularly good. But again, if your attachment style is secure or anxious and you have some of these alignments, you're probably going to end up in a very, very good relationship. Uh, so if you can find that with your partner, and again, this is not just in romantic relationships, you may find that you, your best friend is somebody you have this, these, some of these alignments with because it's somebody who you feel a very close fondness for and care about and love. And you'll see that quite often between best friends or... Um, even parents and children who are very close, you can see that as well. Saturn, Venus, trines, and sextiles. Trines are 120 degrees, sextiles are 60 degrees. So those two planets will be separated by those in the two charts. Venus, Sun, uh, Saturn, Venus, trines creates commitment. When you have that between two people's charts, they generally stay together a long time. Venus, Sun, is one of the strongest markers of love that I see between charts. When you see that, you'll see that in all of the best, longest lasting relationships. And it makes it just easy for two people to love each other. And if you have Venus Sun passing by in your chart, then in a longer term influence, then you probably at that time of your life will meet somebody who you fall in love with. 
I see that a lot when people propose to each other or they get married or they meet the partner who they fall in love with in passing through their own chart. Venus Neptune can also create feelings of love. Even in a square, square is 90 degrees, which is typically a negative influence between two planets, but when you have it between Venus and Sun and Venus and Neptune, if anything negative, it can create a little bit too much idealism of that other person, you know, love to a fault in a way, uh, but not usually negative. Jupiter Sun, you'll see, we talked about that in my last talk, Jupiter Sun is a very good success influence. If you see that between two people, then as long as those two people are together, people are together, they'll be more successful in their life. They'll be that per, they will be lucky for each other uh, in every aspect of their life. Jupiter Moon uh, is another positive, uh, creates a lot of positive emotions. Mars Sun will create chemistry. When you see Mars and Sun alignments between two people, they're sexual chemistry is very very high uh, so they tend to be very um, sexually compatible neptune sun same thing if it's in those positive alignments there can be love and idealism of each other saturn saturn conjunctions you'll see and sextiles and trines you'll see that in married couples a lot because when Saturns are aligned in a positive way in two people's charts, they tend to want to stay together long term, but not like the squares that we talked that was an adverse influence. In squares, you feel stuck with each other. With the positive influence of Saturn, you've, you're with that person because you want to be. There are practical reasons too, but it's usually not a negative. Pluto-Venus creates chemistry too. Uh, a lot of Pluto-Venus, there's like a sexual chemistry that's there. Pluto, Mars, same thing if it's in a positive alignment. Any questions so far? Now let's take a look at some charts together and we can look at some real world examples. Uh, and I'm sure all of you know who Paul Newman is, right? So this is one of the most successful marriages. I, I basically, to get these, peop these people that I'm going to show you now, I just did a Google search of happiest marriages, you know, or longest lasting marriages and the worst marriages. And, and, uh, to do an analysis for you guys. So you can do the same thing. You'll find it's, it's very reliable. Astrology is way more reliable in being able to forecast compatibility than numerology. Numerology, it's, uh, it's a little bit hard to quantify, but astrology, because it is so granular, and so detail oriented, it's also very hard to figure out, but it gives you much more nuance in what you're looking at. Okay, so let's take a look at this. And in the center chart, we have Paul Newman and we have Joanne Woodward, his wife, on the other. And of course, Paul's not around anymore, but this was their two charts, her charts on the outside. And what we're doing is we're comparing the outer chart to the inner chart. And what we see here is well, he was born with a Venus and Sun in the same place, which is a conjunction. But what we're looking for is how that aligns to other things in the chart. And in this case, there is an alignment to Venus. So as I said earlier, Venus to one person's chart, to the sun in the other person's chart creates love. It makes it very easy for two people to be in love with each other. And these two had one alignment of Venus and sun. So here's sun in, in her chart to Venus in his chart in a sextile, 60 degrees. Now, we also have Saturn here at 60 degrees to Venus and Sun, which creates commitment, and which is also positive. We also have Jupiter in alignment from her chart to his Sun, which creates success. So these two, just by being together, they were going to be more successful in whatever it is that they decided to do. And we, they did lots of things in their lives, right, Since from the time they were together. You'll find that a lot where two people individually they may be just doing whatever they were doing and all of a sudden they come together and, or get married or in some kind of relationship and all of a sudden their lives flourish and they become more successful. It's because the vibrations of each other's charts or, or, or uh, numerology in particular, the charts will alter how they show up in the world and they will become more lucky and more successful with one partner where they may become more failures with another one. So who we choose in relationship has a big influence on how successful we are in the world and how healthy we are, all those influences are there. 
here's Will Smith and Jada Pinkett. And again, another very happy relationship. Will is in the middle. What is interesting here is, and you may not be aware of this, but when you have somebody's astrology chart, you can see a lot about who they really are uh, that you may not know. And so it's kind of fun to be able to get inside people's heads when you know astrology well enough to do that. And what you see here is the Will Smith actually has a Mercury and Venus opposition to Saturn. So if you look, there's a Saturn, there's Mercury and Venus. That makes him very insecure. He's actually very self-critical, very insecure. He has a hard time showing affection. And he doesn't do very well in relationships in general. And yet, he was very happy with her, and they've been married for a reason. Now, from this we can see, because the alignment's in his chart, he's actually a very reserved person. He's not actually outgoing and lively and crazy, energetic, but she is. She has a Mars-Uranus alignment in her own chart. Here's Mars-Uranus um, right there. That alone, in this relationship, she's the firecracker, uh, where he's much more laid back and reserved. But what we see here in the, in the chart now, we have Venus in her chart, aligns with, her, with his chart and his sun, which is love. So here is a guy who has trouble of, uh, showing affection and feeling loved. He, he, he has a hard time feeling loved. And prior to her, he probably went through a lot of very bad relationships where he just didn't feel nurtured and loved. But with her, he has that connection. He also has, we have the Sun and Pluto in her chart aligned with his Jupiter and Pluto. That's a very strong success influence. So these two together will make a lot of money. Whatever they put their mind to, they will be very, very successful. They're quite lucky together because of that alignment. And they also have Saturn in alignment here with Mercury and the Moon in a positive alignment. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. This is actually a negative alignment. So Saturn square the Moon in her own chart. That's actually not in his chart. That's in her own chart. What we know from that is he's actually... Mm, but on her own, left to her own, she's not particularly warm. She probably has a hard time expressing warmth and affection. But with him, she has an easier time. So they both act... It's no accident that we pick the partners that we do. He has a problem feeling affection and feeling loved. And she has a problem of, and showing it. So they both actually have a hard time showing warmth and affection. And of course, they ended up together. But because these other alignments make the relationship work... They probably are better off with each other than with somebody else because there are connections between their charts that create more warmth and affection and success. So they're, they're, they're a pretty good couple. All right, now Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson, another long-term relationship. And again, I guess the thing that we didn't, I didn't mention in these previous relationships, which I should have, is the absence of negatives. I only pointed out the positives here, but there are negatives. All the, the negatives that I mentioned in that first page of negatives, you don't see them in these charts. So let's forget about the positives that are there. There are very few negatives. Now, Will Smith and Jada Pinkett actually have some negatives in their own charts, the Saturn, Venus, and the Saturn moon that she has in her chart, but they don't actually interact with each other's chart in a negative way. They just have it on their own. So together, there aren't the negatives. And without that, the positives actually enhance the relationship. And that's why it works. Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson. Again, there aren't a lot of negatives here, but we have a lot of positives. And you'll see among multimillionaire, billionaire success couples, the same kind of Jupiter-Sun alignments, which I, in my last talk, I talked about that. We have here the Sun in his chart is aligned with the Jupiter and Venus in his chart, which again is a good luck success influence. And we have the Jupiter in his chart and Pluto in alignment with the Sun and Neptune in his chart. So they're lucky for each other. Um, you really only need one of those to make it work, but they have both. They also have the Venus-Sun alignment, which is uh, positive for love and warmth. 
And uh, so this, again, is, is a pretty good relationship, more because of the absence of the negative influences than the, than the presence of the positive ones. All right, Whitney Houston and Bobby Brown, very volatile relationship, and you can very clearly see it. There are lots of negatives here. We have Saturn in his chart, alignment with her moon. So there was a problem expressing warmth and affection. He was very cold, or they were probably cold to each other, but him especially in this case because it's his Saturn to her moon. We have here Saturn, um, her Saturn to his sun, and also she was born with the Saturn opposite her own sun and Venus, which is similar to Will Smith in that, not exactly the same, but very similar in that she also was drawn to relationships where there was an absence of love and warmth. And of course, naturally, she chose him. And in this case, the Saturn and Sun are in conjunction over here. What that tells us is that they feel sort of stuck together, you know, or they did. And they would have stayed together a long time out of responsibility or practicality or some reason, but they, they would have had a hard time ever separating, even though it was not a very good relationship. Now, what is interesting, though, is they do have a Venus opposite Mars and Jupiter and Uranus, and they also have this alignment here, the Saturn, Moon, Venus in her chart. Mars is at 90 degrees to... See, he was born with a Mars... 90 degrees to his sun. So he was kind of a hothead anyway. But this alignment hits her chart in very harsh ways, which resulted in that hostility expressing itself into that relationship. So this is not a... There are a lot of negatives here and not a whole lot of positives in this relationship. We have Mike Tyson, Robin Givens, another... Hostile relationship, and we can see it very clearly here. Robin Givens has Mars, Uranus, Pluto, Moon alignment here, which hits his Pluto, Uranus in this chart right there, and also aligns with his Sun. That's a highly hostile, volatile influence between two people's charts. But they did love each other, though, because there's a Venus-Sun alignment in this chart. There was love. Now, on the other hand, there's also a Saturn, Venus in a 90 degrees in the chart as well. So there was love, but there was an, an ability to express that love and warmth, and there was a whole lot of hostility and turbulence in this relationship. Definitely one you want to avoid. Bill Clinton and Hillary Rodham. This is interesting because you can see the behavior of the relationship quite clearly. First of all, here's Bill Clinton in the middle, and her Saturn is exactly on his sun, a few degrees away, so that's in a conjunction. Saturn-Sun, between two people's charts, means they feel stuck together. They're together for practical reasons. The relationship feels a burden to both of them, uh, but they feel like they can't get out for some reason. And it could be, most often it's career or something like that, responsibility to something greater than themselves. And so they are stuck together. And on top of that, there is a square to the moon to Saturn, meaning they have a hard time expressing nurturing to each other. There is also a uh, Venus square to Saturn and the sun here, and that can also be hard to express love and warmth. Not only is her Saturn conjunct his sun, but his Saturn is square her sun, which so they have it both ways. They're kind of stuck with each other, and they don't, they can't get out. And you'll see that quite often in marriages that last and last, and they don't like each other. But uh, so this relationship, there's not really a lot of affection in here. There's not a lot of relationship in this relationship. They're actually together for professional reasons, probably, or something uh, maybe for their kids or some other reason other than the relationship. He was born with a Mars-Neptune-Venus conjunction, which prones him to cheating. He <laughs> has a hard time keeping his eyes and hands off of other relationships. So 
you can see the elements of the relationship quite clearly in here. Not a very, not a very good one. Okay, Ben Affleck, Jennifer Lopez, and now they have been off and on for many years. And again, you'll see uh, here's a Saturn opposite the Moon coldness in the relationship, but. And we have Venus conjunction to Saturn. Again, um, a lack of love and warmth. But we do have a Moon-Neptune conjunction to Neptune. So there is some warmth. They do care about each other. But there are too many adverse uh, elements and not enough positive that this relationship really will be a hard time to make it work long term. Okay, so we're almost at the end. And I want to end on, on a few interesting notes. I'm sure none of you have heard of the hot sauce experiment, but... This is an interesting psychological study that was done that really illustrates how attachment to positive relationships can can create world peace. They took um, Israeli students and Palestinian students and they showed them screens with pictures, flash pictures of the opposite. So the Israelis got to see pictures of Palestinians on a screen and the Palestinians got to see pictures of Israelis on a screen. And they were asked to make a decision on how much hot sauce to administer to the person they were seeing on the screen. And what it turned out was, so they administered a substan- they basically administered a substantial amount of hot sauce to the person on the screen when they were of the opposite, you know, whatever. And, But then they did a different experiment where they subliminally flashed the names of their romantic partner for those who were in in positive, loving relationships on the screen so fast that they couldn't actually consciously perceive them. And the hot sauce levels went back down to what they would give a friend or a loved one. So you can see what an effect that having a intimate, romantic, loving secure relationship has on how we treat other people and what effect that could have globally. I mean, if everybody had, or at least most people had, positive relationships in their life, we would have a more peaceful world. It's really that easy. It's not that complicated. I want to end with a few things. I I talked in the last lecture about the three dimensions that, that we are experiencing third dimension. I'm not going to get into detail about that. If you want to see that, you can take a look online. The other lecture is posted. But I want to address a question that somebody brought up in that last lecture that I didn't adequately address, and it was just because I wasn't thinking along those lines. But the question was, is there a time in the fourth dimension, which is a dimension we're transitioning into right now, where we're living in connectedness rather than separation? And I want to point out that we are already doing that. Even though most of you and most people don't realize this, it's starting to happen already. And you can see that in the sharing economy. Any of you know what the sharing economy is? Well, up until now, our economy has not been based on sharing. For example, if you wanted to get a loan, you go to the bank, and the bank makes money giving you a loan. If you want to travel somewhere and stay in a hotel, you book a Hilton or whatever. That's a uh, economic, uh, a more financially based economy. A sharing economy is one where you don't have institutions making the financial decisions and actually moving more and more away from a financial economy. And we're doing that already. And we're doing that through all of these things that you take for granted all the time. Couch surfing. You can generally travel and sleep on somebody's couch. And usually there's no cost involved at all. Uber and Lyft, which is a sharing economy. It's not, you don't have to rent a taxi cab or a limousine from a company, you, somebody who you don't know picks you up and takes you somewhere. We're interacting as individual human beings. TaskRabbit, which is actually a services company where you can exchange services with other people. Funding Circle is a crowd-based, um, sorry, a, a crowdfunding 
platform now where you can lend micro loans to people around the world instead of people going to a bank to get a loan. You've got uh, Kiva, which again is another loan company, Airbnb. Instead of staying in a hotel, you stay in somebody's home and you see their pictures of their family members and you, in, you are immersed in their own environment. There is times free. If you need a babysitter, you can get a babysitter for free. And it's just people who volunteer to babysit your kids for you. People you don't know. Uh, Washia, which is not in business anymore, but they did laundry. And they were basically crowd-based laundry service. Somebody would come, somebody just like you, would pick up your laundry and do it for you and return it back to you. One Fine Stay, which is an upscale version of the Airbnb, more fancy houses and yachts and things like that, but just regular people. Our goods are exchanging goods. So, for example, if you need a drill, instead of buying one, you borrow it from somebody. And Kickstarter, which obviously is most of you are probably familiar with. It's a crowdfunding platform where if you need to start a new business and you need a $100,000 or $10,000, people like you and me fund those things instead of them having to go to a bank. WAG, you can get somebody to walk your dog for you. You don't have to hire a company. They will come pick up your dog and walk it for you and take care of it instead of going to professional service. So we're already heading into that world where we are starting to take care of each other. We're moving away from an infrastructure, corporate-based economy and more to a crowd-based, individual-based social economy. And forget, if you even just forget that Facebook and all of the, and the internet, proliferation of the internet has made all these things possible, which also is a sign of us moving into that interconnected society. But you can see it in all these various services that are being made available to us by just regular individuals. So it is becoming a reality in our world. Uh, this is the last slide. I, I do all these things we talk about today as part of my Lightworker program, and I work with people to help them to get out into the world and do big things and incorporate all the various tools that we discussed here today, from astrology to numerology to helping you find your life mission and launching out into the world so that you can follow that mission. And if we can be of any help to you in in that way, let us know. And there are some flyers over there as well. And, and I also do relationship counseling and um, compatibility and those sorts of things. So I'm happy to help if you if you feel that that would be beneficial. And you, I mean, you know enough to use a lot of these tools on your own. So now before you go on a date, you know you have to have their birthday <laughs> and at least do their numerology so you know what you're getting into, right? And, uh, and if you feel so inclined to become a professional astrologer, get some books and, and you can definitely delve a little bit more deeply into that person before you take the step. But get out there and start getting connected and, uh, because it's really very important to your own happiness, even though you may not really realize how important at this point. Thank you for coming. Thank you.